mysterious lasers. This strange photograph has been uploaded to social media, showing what appears to be a laser beam setting a small area of the ground on fire. The footage was sent to us from someone who lives in California and said that a beam of energy could be seen coming from the sky. Oddly enough, this isn't the first time that something like this has been captured on camera and it's caused various people to put forward their theories as to what this could be. One idea that was put forward was that this was an energy beam and could have come from a military aircraft. Although this sounds like something from a movie, the United States Department of Defense spends over a billion dollars annually on developing directed energy or concentrated electromagnetic energy weapons. Those who live in the area said that whatever created this beam of energy must have been extremely powerful, as when residents went to the area where the beam hit, it was revealed that there was a hole in the ground. Directed energy weapons have long been a topic of interest and speculation in the realm of military technology, and these advanced weapons systems, which harness and direct concentrated energy beams, have the potential to revolutionize warfare and reshape the dynamics of conflict. These cutting-edge weapon systems, which utilize and channel powerful laser beams, possess the capability to significantly transform the nature of warfare and redefine the intricacies of conflict. The US Navy's Pacific Fleet recently made an announcement regarding the successful test of a cutting-edge high-energy laser weapon capable of effectively neutralizing aircraft while they are airborne. This technological advancement showcases the Navy's continuous dedication to enhancing their defensive capabilities. The laser's impressive power and precision enable it to effectively disable aircraft, marking a significant milestone in military innovation and defense strategies. In a recent announcement from the Navy, it has been reported that the USS Portland, a ship specially designed for amphibious transportation, has achieved a significant breakthrough by effectively employing an advanced solid-state laser system to neutralize an unmanned aerial drone. The Navy has generously shared a collection of visually captivating images and videos that vividly display the successful integration and implementation of this revolutionary technology. The imagery showcases a powerful laser beam emanating from the outer surface of a formidable military vessel. The laser weapons system demonstrator was recently put to the test by the Navy in the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. However, the precise location where the test took place has intentionally been kept undisclosed. In a detailed report published in 2018 by the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the exact power of the weapon under discussion was not explicitly mentioned. Nevertheless, speculations arose suggesting that the laser in question had the potential to achieve a remarkable strength of up to 150 kilowatts. This report aimed to provide a comprehensive and thorough analysis of the subject, shedding light on the various aspects and implications of this cutting-edge technology. According to Captain Carrie Sanders, the commanding officer of Portland, conducting tests in maritime environments to assess the effectiveness of the solid-state laser weapons system demonstrator against unmanned aerial vehicles and small boats, will yield valuable and crucial information about its capabilities in countering potential threats. These tests at sea aim to provide comprehensive insights into the system's performance, analyzing its efficacy and potential applications against diverse types of adversaries. The captain expressed that the Navy is undergoing a revolutionary transformation in naval warfare through the implementation of state-of-the-art technology. The United States Navy asserts that directed energy weapons, specifically lasers, represent a practical and effective means of safeguarding against potential threats posed by small boats or unmanned aerial vehicles, commonly referred to as drones. This innovative defense strategy has gained prominence due to its ability to counter such risks by utilizing advanced laser technology. According to the statement, the implementation of directed energy weapons by the Navy offers numerous immediate benefits to the combatants involved. Moreover, it provides the commanding officer with increased flexibility, enabling them to make more informed decisions and respond effectively in various situations. The Department of Defense is actively engaged in the development and research of directed energy weapons as a strategic response to counter a wide range of threats. These cutting-edge weapon systems are specifically designed to effectively address the challenges posed by missiles and unmanned aerial vehicles.
The Department of Defense and various military departments are actively involved in ongoing initiatives focused on the development and implementation of directed energy weapons. Over the years, numerous initiatives have been undertaken to advance the field of laser weapon systems. These endeavors have involved the creation and refinement of several prototypes and demonstrators, each designed to showcase the capabilities of these cutting-edge technologies. The Department of Defense, along with the military branches, is presently engaged in the development of cutting-edge laser weaponry. This initiative aims to effectively counter and neutralize increasingly significant and formidable threats. In addition to their existing efforts, they are actively developing a range of high-power microwave technologies that can be effectively utilized in engaging military bases through missile or drone swarm attacks. This comprehensive endeavor encompasses the creation of advanced capabilities aimed at increasing the effectiveness and impact of such attacks. In order to ensure a seamless transition of prototypes from a military department to an existing or new acquisition program, it becomes imperative to identify a suitable partner who can provide the necessary support for further development of the technology. This partner plays a crucial role in facilitating the progression of the prototypes towards successful implementation and integration into the program. The Army has meticulously devised a comprehensive strategy that provides a thorough outline of the various responsibilities and contributions of stakeholders involved, as well as a strategically planned schedule for the construction of essential supporting activities. The Navy, having made significant progress in developing and implementing various directed energy weapon prototypes, has successfully identified potential transition partners. However, despite these achievements, the Navy is yet to establish formal documented transition agreements. The Mysterious Harry Turner Incident In the month of September, in the year 1979, Harry Turner, a truck driver specializing in long-distance transportation, suddenly jolted awake from a deep slumber within the confines of his truck, which happened to be parked in a seemingly ordinary lot. Alarmingly, upon awakening, he found himself plagued with a perplexing predicament. He had absolutely no recollection of the area. As he sat in deep contemplation, his attention was drawn to the presence of his pistol, resting beside him, accompanied by the sight of eight spent shells. This sight served as a catalyst, igniting a rush of memories that flooded his mind, bringing back the entire episode with vivid clarity. While journeying along the stretch of the highway that connects Winchester to Fredericksburg, Virginia, the solitary traveller found himself under peculiar circumstances. Suddenly, an extraordinary luminosity, vibrant and dazzling, rapidly approached his sturdy truck. Before he could comprehend the situation, the vehicle appeared to be completely engulfed in an ethereal, otherworldly white radiance. Astonishingly, the steering mechanism ceased to respond to his touch, leaving Turner in a state of introspection as he pondered his next course of action in this unprecedented predicament. Turner experienced a sudden and unexpected event when the door to the truck cabin abruptly swung open. In that moment, he felt a strong and unsettling pressure against his shoulder, as if an external force, whether human or otherwise, was exerting itself to hold him firmly in his seat. Reacting instinctively, Turner discharged all eight rounds that it held. As a result, the pressing sensation on his shoulder subsided. However, by this juncture, fear and confusion had consumed him to such an extent that he ultimately succumbed to unconsciousness. This sequence of events left Turner perplexed and deeply unsettled, and upon regaining consciousness, he found himself in the vast parking lot of the warehouse. The display on his wristwatch indicated that it was slightly past eleven, yet as he glanced towards the wall of the warehouse, a prominently located clock confidently proclaimed it to be three in the morning. Intrigued by this perplexing time disparity, he decided to investigate further, starting with his own truck. Remarkably, despite having covered a considerable distance of 80 miles prior to his enigmatic arrival, his truck's odometer only reflected a mere 17 miles of travel. After the occurrence, Turner's life took a captivating and peculiar turn. As he lay in bed one night, his gaze fixed on the ceiling, an extraordinary realization dawned upon him. He found himself peering beyond the physical barrier. Through the ceiling, he beheld a mesmerizing sight, the intricate tapestry of the night sky adorned with countless sparkling stars. This remarkable experience extended his sense of wonder, 
and offered him a glimpse into a realm that existed beyond the confines of his everyday reality. In a rather unsettling manner, he experienced a heightened sense of fear one evening while observing his slumbering wife. As he gazed at her, he found himself able to visualize her skeletal structure and internal organs, as if her skin had become translucent, or as if he possessed the supernatural ability of X-ray vision. This phenomenon, though perplexing and potentially distressing, allowed him to witness an unprecedented glimpse into the intricate workings of the human body. After undergoing his experience on the highway, Turner developed a strong conviction that his newfound ability was somehow linked to that particular incident. As time progressed, he started recollecting more memories of the traumatic encounter. Strangely enough, he began to acquire knowledge about a star system known as Alpha Centauri, without any rational explanation for how he obtained this information. Interestingly, many other individuals who have also experienced abductions have made similar announcements regarding this specific region of the universe. This phenomenon embodies a fascinating aspect of these encounters, where the abductees gain insights and awareness that extend beyond their prior knowledge and experiences. The individuals who had taken him captive were attired in pristine white outfits, reminiscent of medical practitioners. What added to the surreal nature of the situation was the presence of numbers inscribed on their foreheads. Convinced that he and his vehicle had somehow crossed over into an alternate dimension, he would often refer to them as ultra-terrestrials in conversation, highlighting the extraordinary nature of their presence. In the end, nevertheless, Turner experienced a gradual retreat from social interactions. Notably, there were instances when animals responded oddly in his presence. One particular episode involved a chase by law enforcement across multiple states, triggered by his pursuit of one of these enigmatic creatures. Regrettably, it is believed that Turner has since passed away, leaving behind a legacy shrouded in mystery and intrigue. The Mysterious Mount Shasta Encounter when researching the missing 411 claims, author and supernatural researcher David Paulides stumbled across one of the most unusual and frightening reports that he had ever encountered that was reported near the slopes of Mount Shasta, located in California. According to the author, he had gone on to several talk show radios talking about the bizarre claims of many of the other missing 411 reports that talk about the disappearance of people under borderline supernatural circumstances and their sudden recovery with many of them often found in areas that search and rescue volunteers have already searched over several times. It was after one of these talk shows that David was contacted by a family that claimed to have had a similar experience when their three-year-old son had disappeared near the slopes of Mount Shasta sometime around October of 2010. Due to the bizarre circumstances surrounding the event, David Paulides chose to publish the story around their disappearance under the name John Doe to help protect the identity of the boy, fearing that if his story got out into the public, then he would become targeted by secret organizations or fanatic readers. According to the parents, it was sometime during early October of 2010 that the family decided to visit Mount Shasta as they had done quite a few times before. The spot where the family had visited was located within the shadow of Mount Shasta, alongside a creek that was common for nearby residents to fish out of and enjoy during their vacation. Although John Doe was only around three and a half years old at the time of his visit, members of the family had had more than enough experience within the old forests and nearby trails that John Doe was in more than capable hands. The family would spend the day staying within a few hundred feet of their campsite, with the parents often moving from their camp and the creekside for fishing. Although John Doe spent the entire time at the campsite, it would be at around 6.30 in the evening while the parents were wrapping up their fishing equipment when it became apparent that he had gone missing. Worried that John may have journeyed too close to the creek or taken one of the nearby trails on his own, John's parents immediately contacted the local sheriff and the United States Forest Service for assistance. Several minutes after being contacted, the local sheriff's department and a large crew of search and rescue volunteers began their search in the area for John Doe, spending the next few hours worried that if they were unable to find the young boy before nightfall, then plummeting temperatures could spell disaster. Luckily for the family, after about five hours of searching, at around 11.30pm, the search and rescue crew would locate John Doe and claim to have found him lying atop a thicket of tall shrubs. Oddly enough, 
The location of the thicket was alongside one of the main primary trails that the search and rescue volunteers had used to first get to the area before beginning their search, and was also believed to have been searched several times during the beginning of their operation. Even more peculiar, given where the young three-year-old boy was found, it was almost as if someone had placed the boy atop the thicket, rather than John Doe having climbed and rested atop the shrubs himself. Regardless of the strange findings, the parents were overjoyed at his return, and the United States Forest Service would later provide the public statement that John Doe was recovered and found to be in perfect health. As can be expected, despite the end of the investigation and the safe return of their son, the parents of John Doe were unsatisfied with the claim that their three-year-old son must have wandered off on his own for several hours and climbed a tall shrub on his own. Worried that another hiker or camper could have attempted to have kidnapped John Doe, the parents would make several attempts at questioning their three-year-old son about the cause of his disappearance. Despite their son often being described by their parents as extremely intelligent and often very talkative, it appeared as if John was unable or unwilling to talk about the circumstances surrounding his disappearance and recovery. Rather than press the issue and bring up any unwanted trauma, the parents decided to let their son remain quiet about the nature of his disappearance until he felt he was ready to bring up what happened on his own time. Interestingly enough, it would take only a few days before he would open up after getting a visit from his grandmother. According to the family, after seeing his grandmother, he would begin to tell her the details of his disappearance. According to John, he cannot seem to remember exactly how he went missing. All he can remember was standing within the campsite before suddenly waking up deep within a cave. It was there in that cave that he claimed to see his grandmother's twin. At first, John thought that he was looking at his grandmother as she appeared to look and act just like her, talking in a calm and polite manner. Even more peculiar, the cave appeared to be illuminated by a bright light at the ceiling of the cave. Below the bright light was a long ladder that descended down from the light alongside the walls of the cave. It is unclear whether or not this light is artificial or merely an opening to the outside Though given the fact that John disappeared at around 6.30 in the evening, an hour before the sun had set at around 7.36, the odds of the outside light having been from the sun is highly unlikely. John then claimed that the woman who looked exactly like his grandmother appeared to have been interested in his tummy, though would fail to elaborate on exactly what that meant or why she would be so interested in his stomach. It would be at around this moment in their conversation that John would realize that the woman was not his grandmother after he claimed to have witnessed sparks coming from the top of her head. At the sight of the sparks, John would tell his parents that he believed she was some kind of robot machine and that the sparks were evidence of the woman having been a robot designed to look like his grandmother. Glancing around the cave, John would remember seeing items stuck on the walls, recognizing many of the items as being different kinds of purses and backpacks covered in dust as if they had been there for a long time. Additionally, John claimed that he could see other people in the cave that appeared to have been completely unmoving, believing them also to have been robots. After glancing around the cave and taking in his immediate environment, the woman who looked like his grandma would lay out a sticky piece of paper on the ground and ask John to empty his bowels on it. Although wanting to make the strange woman happy, John refused to do this on the paper after he explained to the woman that he could not just do this whenever he wanted to, but only when his body was ready, and that he was unable to do this because he didn't have to. As if surprised by this information, the woman seemed hesitant to believe John's claims. Sometime after the event, John wouldn't remember how they left the cave, but would suddenly remember being carried by the woman to the thicket and left there after she told him to wait there and not to move. Several minutes later, after the woman walked off and disappeared, the search and rescue volunteers would find John. Curious as to the nature of the events, David would investigate his claims even more closely, choosing to independently question the grandmother about the events and to hear her opinion on the matter. It was during these questions that the grandmother revealed an alarming fact. According to her, the area where John had been recovered was a place she had visited only a few months prior during her last visit. Believing that the strange connection was more than just a small coincidence, David pressed the issue further and asked the grandmother if she could remember any interesting details about visiting the place. 
The grandmother would then describe having visited the exact location where John had disappeared, as she and a friend of hers, alongside her boyfriend, had decided to visit the creek for a relaxing afternoon. After spending the day setting up their camp, the grandmother and her friend decided to sleep by the side of the creek while her boyfriend decided to sleep inside the truck. Although nothing strange had occurred, the grandmother remembered waking up the next day with a stinging pain at the base of her neck that felt as if she had been cut deep. After returning to the truck, where her boyfriend had slept, he had inspected her neck and found a small red dot that did not appear to have been a bug bite, though was difficult to otherwise explain. Nothing else was remembered or discovered about their trip that connected those events with John's encounters. After hearing the strange events recounted by the boy, David would eventually write about the believability of the report after doing an independent investigation on his own. Today, John continued to grow up healthy, and no other strange incidents have occurred since the event back in 2010. The Mystery of the Long Island Creatures Throughout the early 1900s, a series of unexplainable sightings of hairy humanoid creatures were reported all across Long Island, found in the state of New York. These encounters would range from supposed attacks by possible shipwrecked sailors of giant proportions who had been turned into wild men after years of isolation, to man-beasts covered from head to toe in an unexplainable fur that devoured local livestock. The first known sighting of the Long Island Sasquatch monster would be reported during the late autumn of 1893, where two men named Red McDowell and George Farrell were exploring the Rockaway Inlet, an area located roughly six miles from the small town of Rockaway in eastern Long Island. As the two men paddled along in a small paddling boat, they unexpectedly saw a wild-looking figure standing on the shore. Curious as to what the figure may have been, the two men decided to paddle ever close to where the large, human-like figure was standing. As they got closer to it to take a better look, however, the figure let out wild cries, which caused the men to quickly flee from the area in terror. The next day, on November 23rd, another man by the name of John Louth was driving in Rockaway Park when he claimed to have seen a creature that looked similar to what the two men had seen the day before. The next day, Luth's daughter, who was only 18 years old at the time of the sighting, had a close encounter with the unexplainable man-beast, to which she described was like a man only in appearance, and instead behaved like a wild animal. According to the daughter, the man-beast jumped out of the bushes, knocked her to the ground, and ran away while making strange yells and yelping sounds that sounded unearthly. According to additional eyewitnesses, who claimed to have spotted a similar creature in the area over the coming weeks, the creature was considered to be quite large in appearance and had fierce bloodshot eyes, long matted hair, and hair around its face. As the days went on, more and more people reported seeing the creature. The creature's physical description remained consistent across all sightings, leading many to believe that it was indeed a real animal and not a lost or wild hermit living in the area. Even more peculiar, one of the witnesses of the creature claimed to have seen the wild man catch and consume a live chicken raw. In response to the sightings, local authorities launched an investigation into the matter. However, despite their best efforts, they were unable to find any concrete evidence that the creature actually existed. Nonetheless, the sightings continued, and the fear and hysteria surrounding the creature continued to grow. It would be almost two years after these initial sightings, that the local authorities would meet the climax of the wild man of Rockaway legends when a man by the name of Ennis would come forward about an experience witnessed by several dozen individuals at the same time. According to the reported event, travellers who stood on the windswept shores of Rockaway, a terrain considered by locals to be both a rugged and isolated peninsula, situated on the westernmost tip of Long Island, bore witness to another series of truly astonishing and yet similar events during the tumultuous month of November in the year 1895. It would be during the latter days of the month, at the height of the northern East Coast winters, that several eyewitnesses, including a local resident by the name of John C. Ennis of Far Rockaway, reported sightings of a strange and fearsome creature, one that was rumoured to be the wild man, prowling along the sandy beaches and rocky outcrops that lined the coastline. Ennis, in particular, recounted his encounter with this elusive and mysterious entity describing how he had happened to notice the creature only a few yards away from him, which was standing motionless on the sand, 
gazing out to sea. As he approached the strange figure to get a better look, he was met with a sudden and deafening shriek. The shout was recounted by eyewitnesses as having been so loud and powerful that it seemed to reverberate across the entire coastline, causing the men to scatter and run out of fear. Unlike the other men, Ennis would continue to stare at the odd creature, describing the monster as standing at a height taller than any known man and covered from head to toe in blackish-brown hair seemed more akin to a wild bear than a reclusive hermit. Shortly after the shriek was heard, in an instant, the wild man had leapt from the shoreline and down into the frothy and tumultuous waters of the ocean, disappearing from sight with lightning speed, leaving Ennis alone and bewildered on the empty and windswept shoreline. The panic caused by the creature's eerie and bone-chilling cries were later recalled by a local newspaper that wrote about the event and claimed that the creature had even managed to spook a team of sturdy and well-trained horses who had been hitched to a wagon and were marching along the nearby Eldrat's Grove, causing them to suddenly bolt uncontrollably and race towards a neighboring town before they could be brought to a stop and calmed. But the strange and unsettling occurrences did not stop there. It would be over the course of the following days and weeks, other residents of the area began reporting similar sightings of the hairy wild man, describing how they had seen the creature prowling along the shoreline, disappearing into the murky depths of the ocean, or scaling the steep cliffs and rocky outcrops that lined the coast. Many theories were put forward to explain the strange and otherworldly events that were being sighted in Rockaway during that November, ranging from legends of haunting shipwrecked sailors and castaways to rumours of wild and feral men who had lived for years in the rugged wilderness of Long Island, cut off from the rest of society and subsisting off of only the native flora and fauna of the region. But despite the many conjectures and rumours that swirled around the community during those days, the true nature and identity of the wild man of Rockaway remained a mystery and would resurface less than 20 years later near the western areas of Long Island. According to the reports, during the winter months of 1909, a mysterious creature similar in description to the 1893 and 1895 sightings began to terrorise the residents of Long Island near the Eastport and West Hampton areas. The creature was described by witnesses as having eyes of flame and emitting a loud shriek. Although no one got a clear view of the creature, many thought it resembled a large monkey or giant baboon. Rumours began to circulate that the creature may have been a pet from a ship that had wrecked on the shore the previous fall of 1908, but no evidence of such a claim ever surfaced. As news of the creature spread, residents began to take action. On the 7th of February of 1909, a group of armed men decided to scour the woods for the nocturnal beast, but their search proved to be completely fruitless. The creature continued to elude capture, and sightings became increasingly rare. Before long, the sightings would nearly completely dwindle, and the mystery of the Long Island monster would be nearly forgotten before rearing its head once more, 13 years later. During mid-autumn of 1922, the residents of Babylon, Long Island, less than a few miles away from the location of the 1909 sightings, were faced with a mysterious creature that matched the description of the Long Island monster and was believed to have been a ferocious baboon. Panic spread through the area as reports of sightings of the monster and attacks began to surface. The creature, which was said to be larger than any known primate species in the area, left residents feeling vulnerable and afraid. As the weeks passed, tensions rose and fear continued to spread. The authorities struggled to contain the situation and residents began to organize their own efforts to hunt down the creature. These efforts were not without danger as the creature was rumoured to be incredibly strong and unpredictable. By November 5th, organised hunting parties had been formed and were making their way through the surrounding woods in an effort to track down the creature. As they moved deeper into the forest, the dense underbrush and rugged terrain made it difficult to move quickly or quietly, and the hunters were forced to proceed with caution. Despite the challenges they faced, the hunters remained determined to find the creature and put an end to the terror that had gripped their community. Though some claimed that the creature resembled a baboon, while others believed it to be more like a gorilla, whatever its true identity, the creature was a source of fear and uncertainty for all who encountered it. As the days passed, the men's efforts began to pay off. Reports of sightings and attacks began to decrease, 
and the community slowly began to feel a sense of relief. This relief would last for the next nine years before the creature would suddenly resurface. According to a series of similar reports, it would be back in 1931 that a mysterious creature similar in description to the other Wildman ape sightings would be encountered again in the area of Huntington, Long Island. Initially, the sightings of the creature were mundane, with eyewitnesses claiming to see a wandering gorilla, or perhaps a chimpanzee, walking near the outskirts of the community and believed that the animal may have been natural in origin. Despite believing that the creature was nothing more than a known species of primate somehow living in the area, the sightings caused quite a stir among the locals, who were both fascinated and terrified by the prospect of a wild animal roaming their town. The first reports of the 1931 sightings would begin sometime in June, when six people near Mineola claimed to have seen a four-foot-tall creature walking upright and covered in fur from head to toe. The sighting prompted the heavily armed police to rush to the scene, fearing that the animal was an escaped zoo primate from one of the nearby Long Island zoos. Oddly enough, despite making a thorough search of the area, no trace of the creature was found. Shortly after their search, the Nassau County Police checked with area zoos for any missing animal cases, but all animals for each zoo were accounted for and no evidence of an escaped primate was ever found. This left the residents of Huntington, Long Island to wonder what they had seen. On June 29th, Police Captain Earl Comstock directed several teams of armed police accompanied by two dozen volunteers who scoured the countryside. The organized search would find no sign of the mysterious ape-like creature. The only possible clue they discovered were strange human-like tracks that seemed to be of an animal walking on two legs. The size of the tracks was about that of an adult hand, though the big toe was set further back than on a human similar to the opposed digit of a monkey. The mystery deepened when, on July 18th, a gorilla-like creature was spotted by a family in Huntington as it crashed through some shrubbery before disappearing with a panicked shriek. An hour after the event, three miles away, a farmer saw a similar strange animal. Once again, the police were stumped and their search turned up nothing. The residents of Huntington, Long Island were left to ponder what kind of creature they were dealing with. Nothing more was ever found or reported of the strange Long Island creature, and the Huntington area never knew what animal may have been roaming through their community. In the end, no one could say for certain what the creature was, and the mystery of the Long Island monster remained unsolved. Law enforcement officers speculated that the creature may have been nothing more than a hoax or a possibly escaped exotic pet, while others believed it to have been a genuine unknown animal. The Mysterious Disappearance of Alexander Kruk On July 17, 2020, Alexander Kruk, a 33-year-old individual, went missing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance revolve around his connection with a woman he met online and his intentions to meet her in Mexico. Since then, there has been no trace of him. Alexander Michael Kruk, born on January 15, 1987, Hales from Illinois, but predominantly grew up in the vibrant city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, during his formative years. Throughout his journey, he has assumed the esteemed role of a proud father. Keith Kruk, hailing from the charming city of Waukesha, Wisconsin, received his education at Waukesha South High School, where he delved into his passion for athletics. Demonstrating remarkable talent, Kruk showcased his excellence as an athlete, particularly in the game of baseball. Kruk's life took a turn for the worse during his high school years when he started associating himself with the wrong group of people. Unfortunately, he succumbed to the depths of addiction, which became a significant obstacle in his life. Concerned about his well-being, his family made efforts to get him the help he needed by sending him to a rehabilitation center. Following his graduation, Kruk pursued higher education at the University of Wisconsin and Milwaukee Area Technical College focusing on the field of CNC programming. Additionally, he gained practical experience as a welder subsequent to completing his college education. During the period when he went missing, Kruk was residing with some acquaintances in a residential area located on West Finn Place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It is worth mentioning that he was quite active on various social media platforms, frequently sharing updates and maintaining regular communication with his family members. This suggests that he had a strong online presence, 
and was actively engaged in staying connected with his loved ones. On the 17th of July, 2020, there was a sighting of Alexander Kruk near West Finn Place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At that time, he was reportedly seen in that specific area. Kruk's final interaction with his family occurred through a telephone conversation on August 6, 2020. This communication marked their most recent connection before the present moment. Following his unavailability, his family proceeded to file a report of a missing person with the Milwaukee Police Department, concerned about his whereabouts and unable to establish any communication with him. Alexander Kruk was beset by health challenges, and his family holds the belief that his psychological well-being was deteriorating during the period when he went missing. Kruk's acquaintances have shared that he allegedly formed a connection with an individual through an online platform prior to his vanishing. It was revealed that they engaged in conversations about potentially embarking on a journey to Texas, followed by a subsequent visit to Mexico in order to meet this woman in person. Despite the urging of his friends to reconsider, there is no concrete evidence validating that Kruk ever arrived at either of these destinations, raising doubts about the fruition of his travel plans. According to Kruk's acquaintances, he mentioned his intention to travel to California via a Greyhound bus, hinting at the prospect of a lucrative opportunity. However, there is a lack of evidence to substantiate the claim that he actually departed from Wisconsin. Kruk, prior to his mysterious disappearance, was devoid of both financial resources and the means for international travel, such as a passport or any form of transportation. It is worth noting that he did not possess an automobile and predominantly relied on alternative methods of mobility, such as walking, utilizing public transportation, or seeking assistance from fellow individuals for commutation purposes. According to a family member of Kruk, in July 2020, there was a sighting of him in the company of a Hispanic woman, although her identity remains unknown. It was reported that during that time, she was driving either a maroon Nissan Murano or a white Nissan sedan. This information showcases the potential connection between Kruk and the Hispanic woman, raising questions about their relationship and the circumstances surrounding their encounter. According to numerous acquaintances, there are several individuals who assert that they have encountered the mysterious woman as well. They affirm that she would occasionally provide him with meals and offer transportation services. After a thorough investigation, law enforcement officials have determined that there is no indication of any criminal activity involved in the mysterious vanishing of Alexander Kruk. The exact circumstances surrounding Alexander's disappearance continue to elude the authorities, leaving his case classified as a missing person. Mysterious Handbags of the Gods The ancient world is full of mysteries. What came before us has fueled so many disciplines and fields of study, letting us uncover the secrets lost to time as well as to help advance our knowledge in the future. When we look back, we can often be surprised to find how advanced ancient civilizations were, from technological inventions to daily life to the language and communication left behind. Of course, some of the most well-known records we have from ancient societies are not written words but are quite literally etched into time as carvings. One aspect of these carvings has been a subject of especially close study and earned a title for itself as a far more mysterious symbol than many of the others. It seems to resemble a modern-day handbag. This image is seen across a huge number of ancient cultures, spanning various countries and communities, yet still distinctively sat looking remarkably out of place to a 21st century audience. It has been seen in images created by Sumerians in Iraq, has been sighted in ancient temples in Turkey, in work crafted by the Maori in New Zealand and in Central America made by the Olmecs. So, with this so-called handbag spanning such a great geographical coverage, it should be no surprise that it has made frequent occurrences throughout time too with our earliest known record of it dating back to the end of the Ice Age. With plenty of time to have attempted to decipher it, what do researchers think the ancient world were telling us with this handbag symbol? The symbol has earned itself the handbag nickname since it does resemble how we might draw a bag today. In most of the instances in which we see it, the symbol has a rounded, semicircle top, giving it a handle-like appearance, and then we see a rectangular bottom. Researchers have noted that sometimes extra details appear that seem to indicate some textures or patterns. Adding to the handbag connotations, 
The symbol has been shown in the hand of various people, gods, and mythical entities. It often does occur as a single image. One theory that has been posed describes the handbag to be representative of the cosmos. We already know that in many ancient societies, across a somewhat broad geographical scope, a circle has been used to portray the spiritual world, or, much more broadly, non-material concepts and beliefs. By contrast, those same societies would use a square to demonstrate the earth and material, familiar concepts. Therefore, the semicircle or the rounded handle of the handbag could be the world of spirituality and the rectangular base of the bag, the earth. The joined nature in this theory acts as a symbol of the material and non-material worlds, the earth and the sky becoming unified either once again or for the first time, dependent upon each ancient culture's beliefs. This theory that the handbag symbol reflects the cosmos as one fits in line with some of the interpretations of the wider pieces in which the handbag can be seen. For example, in the ruins of the Gobleki Tepe, which is believed to possibly be the world's first temple located in the southeast of Turkey, the handbag motif can be seen to crop up three times amongst different carvings we believe depict the various creations of the cosmos. However, we cannot be certain about these interpretations. The purpose of the Gebekli Tepe remains unknown. Though following excavations, it's believed by some that it could have been a site for religious sacrifices. The handbags can be seen surrounded by animals, gods and mythical creatures, all lending to the understanding of the cosmos being a probable explanation. This is because it's believed by current experts that some of the earliest religions focused on worship of the elements of life on Earth. It would make sense that the handbags show the joining of non-material elements with our planet and that their presence could be part of what makes this site a temple. There are numerous other interpretations of this symbol varying across several different cultures. Some other understandings include the handbag being used to carry magic dust, as seen in Assyrian art in Iraq, or herbs intended to be used as recreational substances, as seen in ancient Mesoamerica. Of course, it's more than physical items that can be carried. In New Zealand, a Maori myth describes a man who met the gods and returned with baskets of wisdom, and so the handbags are symbolic of worshipping knowledge provided by the divine gods. One final, slightly different use is seen in the hieroglyphs seen in ancient Egypt. Here, the handbag signal carried not knowledge from the gods, but instead the gods and goddesses themselves. It's thought to be representative of a tent, with the rounded top forming the poles and the bottom showing an animal skin or cloth. It's fascinating to see this one symbol occur in so many distinct cultures across a far-spread geographical range. Even the different usages and interpretations appear to have a significant overlap, considering knowledge, worship, and the gods. Illegal digging, also known as looting or tomb raiding, has been a persistent problem in Egypt for many years. The country's rich archaeological heritage and the lure of valuable artifacts have made it a prime target for looters. According to a 2018 report by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, there were more than 30 cases of illegal digging or attempted illegal digging reported in the country that year alone. However, it is believed that many more cases go unreported. Illegal digging can have a devastating impact on Egypt's cultural heritage. It can lead to the destruction of archaeological sites and the loss of important artifacts that can never be recovered. It also fuels a black market for antiquities where stolen artifacts are sold for large sums of money. The Egyptian government has taken steps to combat illegal digging, including increasing penalties for those caught and stepping up patrols of archaeological sites. However, the problem persists, and more needs to be done to protect Egypt's cultural heritage from looters. Just recently, a video of a digger was uploaded to social media, where the user said that they found something interesting. The object in question appears to be gold, and has on the back of it hieroglyphics, while on the front is what appears to be an unknown female Egyptian.
The carving is strange as it always appears to be staring at you. However, the phenomenon of the eyes appearing to follow you is actually an optical illusion called the Mona Lisa effect. It is named after Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, the Mona Lisa, which appears to follow viewers no matter where they stand. The effect occurs because of the way our eyes perceive objects in the visual field. When we look at a painting or a portrait, our brains perceive it as a three-dimensional object, even though it is actually flat. This means that our brains try to adjust our perspective based on the position of the painting, causing the eyes to appear to follow us. Oddly enough, though, it's reported that the digger who found this artifact also found various other ancient relics, saying that gold bars along with small golden statues were also found. The digger went on to detail that these objects were found inside an old abandoned tunnel, but didn't give away any details as to where this tunnel was located. Ancient Egypt was one of the most important and influential civilizations in human history. The discoveries and artifacts left behind by the ancient Egyptians provide valuable insights into their culture, religion, social structure, art, and technology. There are various reasons why people illegally dig in Egypt, but most of them are driven by the desire to find valuable antiquities that can be sold on the black market. These antiquities are often stolen from archaeological sites or tombs and sold to collectors or dealers who are willing to pay large sums of money for them. Another reason is the lack of economic opportunities in certain areas of Egypt, particularly in rural areas where poverty is widespread. In such areas, people may turn to illegal digging as a way to make money, since the sale of antiquities can be a lucrative business. In some cases, political instability and conflict can also contribute to illegal digging. During times of unrest, security forces may be preoccupied with other issues, allowing looters to operate with relative impunity. Unfortunately, illegal digging in Egypt has a significant impact on the country's cultural heritage. When antiquities are stolen and sold on the black market, they are often lost forever, with little hope of ever being recovered or returned to their rightful place in history. Additionally, illegal digging can cause damage to archaeological sites and tombs, further eroding Egypt's rich cultural legacy. Interestingly, gold was highly valued in ancient Egypt, and was used for a variety of purposes, such as jewellery, religious objects, and as a symbol of power and wealth. The ancient Egyptians obtained gold from various sources, including mines in Nubia and the Eastern Desert. Some of the gold was used to make elaborate burial masks, jewellery, and other funerary objects for the pharaohs and other elite members of society. The tombs of some pharaohs, such as King Tut, were filled with gold objects, including the famous solid gold funerary mask. It's believed that much of the gold from ancient Egypt was eventually melted down and reused for other purposes over time. Some of it may have been lost or stolen during the many invasions and conflicts that occurred throughout Egyptian history. However, there are still many ancient Egyptian artifacts made of gold that have survived to this day and continue to fascinate people around the world. The ancient Egyptians were most successful during the period known as the New Kingdom, which lasted from approximately 1550 BCE to 1069 BCE. This era saw a period of great expansion and prosperity for Egypt, with powerful pharaohs who were able to establish Egypt as a major military and economic power in the region. During the New Kingdom, Egypt experienced a renaissance in art, architecture and culture. The pharaohs of this era built magnificent temples and palaces, and many of the most famous monuments of Egypt, such as the Temple Complex at Karnak and the Valley of the Kings, were constructed during this time. The New Kingdom also saw the rise of the powerful pharaohs, such as Ahmose I, Hatshepsut, Thutmose III, Amenhotep III, and Ramses II, who were able to conquer neighboring territories, establish trade networks, and build an empire. One of the most significant events of the New Kingdom was the reign of Akhenaten, who attempted to establish a new monotheistic religion centered around the worship of the sun god, Aten. While his religious reforms were ultimately unsuccessful, they represented a major departure from traditional Egyptian beliefs and had a profound impact on Egyptian culture. The New Kingdom came to an end in the late 11th century BCE due to a combination of factors including economic instability, internal unrest, and invasions by foreign powers. However, its legacy continued to influence Egyptian culture and society for centuries to come, 
and many of its achievements continue to fascinate and inspire people around the world. A few months ago, it was reported that sheep across the world were observed walking around in circles, and people have now said that the phenomenon has just started up again. Due to this strange behavior, it's caused some to suggest that animals may be sensing something. Interestingly, some animals have been observed to have the ability to detect earthquakes before they occur. This is believed to be due to their heightened sensitivity to changes in their environment, such as vibrations or electromagnetic fields. One animal that is known for its ability to detect earthquakes is the common toad. Researchers have found that toads will often leave their breeding sites and move to higher ground several days before an earthquake occurs. Similarly, other studies have shown that certain species of fish, snakes, and even domesticated dogs and cats have exhibited unusual behavior prior to an earthquake. Scientists have said that not all animals have this ability, and more research is needed to fully understand the mechanisms behind this phenomenon. The United States Geological Survey said the following about this phenomenon. Evidence abounds of animals, fish, birds, reptiles and insects exhibiting strange behavior anywhere from weeks to seconds before an earthquake. However, consistent and reliable behavior prior to seismic events and a mechanism explaining how it could work still eludes us. End quote. One person commented on social media saying that they have a koi pond and she observed her fish swimming around in circles for hours. This event happened in early March and she said that a few days later the region where she lives was hit by a four-magnitude earthquake. China is located in an area of the world that is particularly prone to earthquakes due to its location on the Pacific Ring of Fire. The Pacific Ring of Fire is a region that encircles the Pacific Ocean and is characterized by high levels of seismic activity and volcanic eruptions. China is also situated on the boundary between the Eurasian Plate and the Indian Plate, which are two of the Earth's tectonic plates. The collision of these two plates has created a complex system of fault lines that runs through China, resulting in frequent earthquakes. While earthquakes are common in China, the country has implemented measures to mitigate their impact. This includes seismic monitoring systems, earthquake-resistant building codes, and public education campaigns on earthquake preparedness. Oddly enough, this strange behavior was observed a few months back, when sheep were seen walking around in circles. It was reported that hundreds of sheep had been observed walking in circles for over 12 days. Not long after the first report was made, others came forward and said that sheep were observed doing the same thing across different countries, with reports coming in from the United Kingdom and Mongolia, with local farmers confused as to why the sheep were doing this for such a long period of time, with one farmer saying that it happens every so often, but has never lasted more than an hour. The cause of this strange behavior is still not known. It's known that China is often hit by earthquakes, and at the time it caused some to suggest that perhaps the sheep could feel something happening. The United States Geological Survey said the following. The earliest reference we have to unusual animal behavior prior to a significant earthquake is from Greece in 373 BC. Rats, weasels, snakes and centipedes reportedly left their homes and headed for safety several days before a destructive earthquake. Anecdotal evidence abounds of animals, fish, birds, reptiles and insects exhibiting strange behavior anywhere from weeks to seconds before an earthquake. Most but not all scientists pursuing this mystery are in China or Japan. An earthquake forecast was made in China several decades ago based on small earthquakes and unusual animal activity. Many people chose to sleep outside of their homes and thus were spared when the main earthquake indeed occurred and caused widespread destruction. However, usually no large earthquake follows this type of seismic activity, and unfortunately, many earthquakes are preceded by no precursory events whatsoever. End quote. It's for this reason that people worry when they see animals acting like this, with residents fearing that a big earthquake could hit the region within the next few days. As mentioned, for centuries there have been accounts of animals acting strange before an earthquake devastates a region. A few years back, Scientists came forward and said that they have filmed the behavior of wild animals prior to a quake and believe this could be documented evidence of animals behaving differently just prior to an earthquake. The researchers were studying birds in Peru and found that days before an earthquake hit, the birds ran for shelter, 
with the team suggesting that the animals running for cover may be linked to airborne ions. As of right now, scientists and animal experts have said that there's several reasons why animals may walk in circles, saying that some animals, particularly those with poor eyesight, may use circling as a means of navigating. By walking in circles, they may be able to detect changes in their environment, such as the location of food or water sources, and orient themselves more accurately. Certain animals, especially those in captivity or under stress, may exhibit repetitive behaviors, including circling. This behavior may be a result of boredom, anxiety, or a lack of stimulation. In some cases, animals may walk in circles due to neurological disorders, such as vestibular disease. This condition affects the inner ear, which can cause disorientation and loss of balance. Injury Animals may also walk in circles if they have sustained an injury to their limbs or other parts of their body. This behavior may be an attempt to alleviate pain or discomfort. It's important to note that circling behavior in animals should be investigated and monitored by a veterinarian, as it can sometimes be a symptom of a more serious underlying condition. Our oceans are vast, beautiful, and somewhat of a mystery. Beauty lies within the hidden depths. Even now we lack knowledge about the truths of our oceans and what truly lurks within them. Recently, marine biologists have warned that whales, along with other species, have started acting strange, highlighting that more and more beachings are happening around the world. Other creatures that have suddenly started washing up on shores include dolphins, octopuses, and turtles. These are just the latest reports to come from the animal world, and some of these events are confusing scientists. Birds have also been observed across the United States falling from the sky, causing wildlife researchers to conduct their own studies to try and figure out why this is happening. Although a variety of reasons have been put forward, none have been able to explain why so many animals have been observed acting strange. The same is happening with these whale beachings, and many experts who've looked into these events have labelled them as worrying. Scientists have said that the whales that keep on washing up on California beaches are unusual. Throughout the years we have not treated our oceans with the respect it deserves. Now, whales have been washing up on California beaches. So far, more than 20 whales have perished upon the sands of the Golden Coast within the past few months. There's been some confusion over the cause, but researchers have listed several factors, such as the ongoing climate crisis and ships bashing into whales at high speeds, which is wounding or fatally harming them. In the California Bay area, a fin whale and a massive 47-foot pygmy sperm whale were found beached, and even earlier in 2022, four whales washed up on California beaches in less than 10 days. Overall, it's believed that just over a dozen whales have been discovered deceased on beaches in 2022 alone. According to the spokesman for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Michael Milstein, the entire phenomenon is atypical and extremely concerning, yet 2022 was not even the worst year for whales. In 2019, the total number of whales found perished reached 34. In 2021, that number totaled 18. By comparison, this has been a calm year, and yet nonetheless worrying. Since 2019, investigations have been ongoing to determine a direct cause for this frighteningly high number. Evidently, our sea life is threatened. Fortunately, the overall population of whales is not yet endangered, but should things continue on this path, there is no telling what could happen to them in the near future. Only six years ago, biologists believed there to be 26,000 whales living in the northern American oceans. By 2022, they believe that the population has fallen to less than 20,000. As of right now, this is still sustainable for a population, but it's rapidly falling. The Biden administration has been urged by oceanic scientists to discuss with the United States Navy reforms of sea life safety codes. Her Majesty's Australian ship was said to have wounded several whales which entered the San Diego naval base, causing them to lose their life. As such, Biologists are pleading for the Navy to readjust its rulings when it comes to its treatment of sea creatures. The official statement by the National Marine Fisheries Services was the following. These deceased whales are grisly proof of the Navy's dire ongoing threat to vulnerable marine mammals. We're asking the Biden administration to find a better balance of marine protection with military readiness. End quote. 
Hopefully, these majestic creatures will be rescued and treated with sufficient care in the future. After the Navy's reluctance to answer to these pleas, the Center for Biological Diversity gave the Navy a notice of their intent to sue if they do not act soon. Navy to re-examine effects of Pacific training exercises. Tied to previous happenings with deteriorating whale populations, the United States Navy has since agreed to re-examine its training practices and oceanic protocols. The United States Navy officially declared that it would look into the consequences of its current place training exercises regarding sea life. Specifically, the United States Navy is going to analyze its impacts on the populations of sea mammals. There are endangered species within regions of Hawaii and Southern California, which scientists are worried will soon become extinct if nothing is done, further saying that the Navy's harmful underwater training protocols remain unrestrained. This change was only implemented after the Center of Biological Diversity made their intent to sue them, with some critics believing that if they had not, the Navy would have continued hurting sea creatures without care for the environmental damage. The intent to sue occurred after the discovery that San Diego's military destroyer vessel took the lives of two fin whales, which were attached to its hull as the vessel dragged their carcasses across the waters back to port. This happened in May of 2022, and the fin whales were found to be that of a mother whale and her calf. The Navy claimed that those aboard the military destroyer were not aware of the whales they hit as they were focused on military training, only discovering the whale bodies once the vessel docked. A coalition was formed between the National Fisheries Service and the Center of Biological Diversity to tackle the rampant issue of fated whales, both deciding that the Navy has to respond to its actions for the sake and future of sea animals in the Pacific. Kristen Monsell, who is the legal director of the Center of Biological Diversity, said the following. We're glad to see the Navy re-examining the harms of its training exercises on these mighty but vulnerable creatures. These military activities can wreak havoc on whales, dolphins and other marine mammals through explosions, sonar and ship strikes. We hope this process leads to new mitigation measures like slowing ships down in important whale habitats. End quote. Although they cannot be blamed for the causation of all fated whales in the Pacific, the Navy's vessel strikes are now a known factor feeding deeper into the problem biologists are desperately trying to solve. Back in April, the Centre petitioned for the federal government to create a speeding limit for ships and boats passing through whale habitats with a maximum 10-knot speed limit on the waves to protect the whales from further danger. Federal records reveal that in the area of the West Coast, more than 26 ship strikes have taken the lives of whales, and this happened within just four years. In nature, whales live as long as humans, meaning that we are their primary cause of their demise. Studies published only in the past few months showcased that vessel strikes are twice as dangerous as we thought them to be and do immense amounts of damage to the creatures caught in their wake. It's theorized that the number of annual vessel strikes could be up to 20 times the recorded number, and this is due to the fact that whales which do not wash up onto beaches sink into the ocean, never to be seen on the surface again. Underwater explosions used by the Navy as military practice also damage sea life and put whales and other beings at risk. These explosions may not necessarily wound or take their life, but the aftermath can be horrific with whales falling sick, becoming infertile or disturbing their breeding, ability to feed, or by messing with whale migration cycles. Zooplankton, a building block of all aquatic life, is vastly damaged by the sound of these explosions. Currently, the Navy is protected by a permit granted to them in 2018, which was meant to last five years, but has since been extended to be active until 2025. This permit allows them to be exempt from repercussions regarding any sea mammals, including dolphins and whales that they injure or harm. It states that there will be no repercussions as long as recorded cases of wounded sea life does not exceed 12.5 million. So far, the reported numbers have revealed more than 3,000 various marine mammals have been injured, 20 of which were humpback whales. There have been just under 10,000 cases of wounded or deceased blue whales. Mrs Manning, a marine biologist from the United Kingdom, said that this is something that we are seeing more of, and that in general, sea life behaviour has changed over the last 40 years, and that now we have documented proof of creatures such as whales and dolphins acting differently. She continued by saying that whales are bashing into ships at high speeds, which is in turn causing them damage, and that a large number of marine life seems to be deviating from their usual navigation. 
further noting that sometimes these beachings will be caused by injuries, but she said that what some websites fail to mention is that most of the time those injuries are caused by humans, be it via fishing or in regards to the ocean being more cluttered with ships. An interesting study that looked into this found a direct correlation between negative whale behavior and Navy sonar. Although sonar has been an incredibly helpful tool during various points in history, it's safe to say that those who used sonar in the early days were not considering the impact on marine life when first using it. There are two different types of sonar, active and passive. Active sonar, which has been commonly used by navies, involves a device, known as a transducer, that emits a sound pulse into the water. When this sound pulse hits a surface, like a submarine or a whale, the pulse reflects back to the transducer, indicating that there is something in the water. These reflection pulses can then be calculated to determine how far away this object or creature is. Passive sonar, on the other hand, utilizes a system that does not emit sound, and instead listens to detect any sound that comes near it. However, since 2001, it has been determined that active sonar is extremely harmful to whales and other aquatic animals, specifically a type of active sonar referred to as low-frequency active sonar. Low-frequency active sonar emits sound at a decibel nearly twice that of a rock concert and can maintain the decibel of a concert for 300 miles underwater. Not only is this incredibly loud, it's severely detrimental to animals who primarily use long-range sound underwater to communicate with each other, to find food, and to navigate. Low-frequency active sonar has led to animals losing contact with other members of their species, to them no longer foraging for food, and to them swimming deep or rising quickly because they are frightened by the sound. Low-frequency active sonar has also caused hearing loss and hemorrhages in whales and dolphins and has contributed to a large amount of strandings, also known as beachings, in which many animals have passed away on land, either due to being beached or to the severe injuries sustained from low-frequency active sonar. This has disproportionately affected beaked whales, a type of whale that typically dives deeper in the ocean. The United States Navy's authorization of using low-frequency active sonar has come under legal battle more than once, and in 2012, it was found that the Navy was in violation of the Marine Mammals Protection Act of 1972. When brought to court, it was ruled that the National Marine Fisheries Service was not doing enough to protect sea life from the Navy, and National Marine Fisheries Service has since put limitations on the Navy's use of low-frequency active sonar. Environmental agencies such as the Natural Resources Defense Council and other environmental groups, have also limited the Navy's use of active sonar, which is now only supposed to be allowed in mammal-free waters in certain locations. However, despite evidence of its harmful effects on aquatic animals, the Navy is still permitted to use low-frequency active sonar in our oceans. Sonar, which stands for sound navigation and ranging, is a technology that uses sound waves to locate and identify objects in water. Sonar systems are used by ships and submarines for navigation and to locate underwater objects. The use of sonar has been shown to have negative impacts on whales and other marine mammals. Whales rely on sound to communicate, navigate and find food. They use echolocation, a biological form of sonar, to locate prey and navigate in their environment. When they encounter intense sonar signals, it can disrupt their behavior and cause them to become disoriented or even stranded on shore. The loud sounds produced by sonar can also cause physical damage to whales. Some studies have suggested that exposure to high-intensity sonar can cause hemorrhaging in the ears and brain, which can lead to disorientation and even death. Whales are particularly vulnerable to sonar because they are highly social and rely on their ability to communicate with each other to survive. When their communication is disrupted by loud sonar signals, it can have a significant impact on their ability to find food and navigate in their environment. Overall, the use of sonar has been shown to have a negative impact on whale populations and efforts are being made to reduce its use in areas where whales are known to inhabit. The Hacking Group Anonymous is a loosely organized collective of individuals who engage in a range of activities, including cyber activism, digital protests, and hacks against organizations or individuals they perceive as engaging in unethical or illegal activities. The group is known for its use of Guy Fawkes masks, which have become a symbol of their movement. It's difficult to say whether Anonymous is good or bad, as their activities are often controversial 
and can be seen as either positive or negative depending on one's perspective. Some of their activities have been directed at promoting social justice causes, such as their efforts to expose the police system and government corruption. On the other hand, some of their activities have been criticized for crossing legal and ethical boundaries, such as their attacks on private companies or individuals. Ultimately, the activities of anonymous and other hacking groups are subject to debate and interpretation. While some may view their actions as a form of resistance against oppression or injustice, others may see them as engaging in illegal and harmful activities that violate the rights of others. It's important to consider both the potential benefits and risks of their actions, and to hold them accountable for any harm they may cause. The lack of a formal structure means that anyone can claim to be a member of Anonymous, and the group's actions are often carried out by loosely affiliated individuals and groups. One member has recently come forward and noted that something strange can be seen in the background of a recent SpaceX mission. The user said the following, With the increased presence in space, along with new technology giving us an insight into the final frontier, we are making new discoveries with each passing day. An interesting find has been released online, showing what appears to be a strange object in the background of this SpaceX mission. One of the first things that you'll notice is that this glowing object appears to change its trajectory, something that doesn't normally happen in these types of videos. This brings up a variety of questions, as for years now astronauts, along with former NASA workers, have detailed mysterious objects in space. It's too early to jump to conclusions, but having video evidence of a strange object changing direction in space is worthy of further examination. End quote. Interestingly, when the video was submitted to various groups that research strange objects, users couldn't decide on what the object was, suggesting that it matches the description of other objects that have been detected in space. One user said that you can see the light stop and then change direction. Oddly enough, these mysterious lights are not anything new, and for years now, glowing orbs have been detected in the background of videos taken from space. NASA has also captured objects which have appeared in the background of their videos, and it's led to some interesting discussions. One of the reasons for this is because when these objects show up, within seconds the live broadcast is shut down. Those who've studied this phenomenon have said that the International Space Station cameras offer some of the best evidence of these bizarre objects. Not everyone was impressed with the footage, though, with one user saying the following. You can see that this object passed close to the front, and to me that suggests that it's close to the rocket. What we are most likely seeing here is ice. End quote. Staying on the subject of Elon Musk, he's recently come forward and said that Earth is going to face a massive population collapse over the next 20 to 30 years. While talking at an artificial intelligence conference, Elon was asked about what his thoughts were on artificial intelligence and what the future holds for humans. Although he's been vocal about artificial intelligence and how we need to be careful, he said that another problem we are facing is that of population collapse, saying that in 20 years' time there's not going to be enough people. He continued with the following, I think we have a serious issue with population collapse that's far bigger than what people realize. I think we need to watch out for population collapse. This is somewhat counterintuitive to most people. They think that there are so many humans, maybe too many humans, but this is just because they live in a city. If you're in an aircraft and you look down and say, dropped a cannonball, how often would you hit a person? Basically never. In fact, there's stuff falling from space all of the time. Natural meteorites and old rocket stages, but no one worries about them. In fact, all humans on Earth could fit in the city of New York. The cross-section of humans as seen from Earth is extremely tiny, basically vanishingly small. So we need to watch out about population collapse. Low birth rate, I think, is a big risk, and it's also not exactly top secret. You can go and look at Wikipedia for birth rate. 
So this is definitely the civilization that will end with a whimper rather than a bang. Because it would be a sad ending where the average age becomes very high and really the youth are effectively enslaved to take care of the old people. This is not a good way to end. End quote. Others have noticed how Elon's behavior has changed recently, with some saying that he may know things that others don't. For example, some have said that it's strange how one of the richest people on the planet doesn't want to live on Earth anymore, and that it's almost like he knows what's coming, and that he's doing all he can to get off this planet. The sad part about this was some of the comments that were made by users who listened to what Elon said. One person said the following, What's the point in bringing something so precious into this current world? Why would someone do that? The truth is, most people are bringing life into this world to mask over something. You can't sit there and tell me that this current model that we all live under is a happy one. It's not even like life is easy these days. If there were lots of perks, I could understand it. But it just feels like we are constantly fighting. I understand that life isn't easy, and that the world doesn't owe you anything. But just listening to things that happen on a daily basis is enough to put you off. I feel like this. My friends feel like this. And their friends feel the same. I feel like you're going to have a generation of people who won't have children because of how things are. End quote. It's currently difficult to predict with certainty whether Earth will face a population collapse. However, there are some indications that suggest that the rate of population growth may slow down in the coming decades. One of the primary reasons for this is the decline in fertility rates in many countries around the world. Researchers who've studied this topic have said that as women gain more education, economic opportunities, and access to reproductive health care, they tend to have fewer children. This has already led to a decline in population growth rates in many developed countries. Furthermore, some experts predict that as the world becomes more urbanized and people move away from traditional rural lifestyles, the birth rate may continue to decline. This is because urbanization tends to be associated with lower fertility rates. However, it's important to note that even if the rate of population growth slows down, the global population is still expected to continue to increase in the coming decades. This means that Earth will continue to face significant challenges related to resource depletion and environmental degradation. Therefore, it's important to focus on sustainable development and population management strategies to ensure that the planet can support future generations. Others, though, carried on from this and said that bringing a life into this world is near impossible for the average person. One user said the following, If you actually sit down and do the math, the vast majority of young people shouldn't be having children. Firstly, they should be allowed to, but due to the current state of the economy, it's just not doable with the wages that people are on. This is why I feel like many experts are wrong, because for real change to come about, you need an entire system change. This isn't about people not wanting children, it comes down to people physically not being able to afford them, which is so messed up when you remember that the majority of these people are working full-time. Most people will have this example, but my parents purchased their house for £45,000 while having a wage of £19,000. Their wages have increased by £20,000, but their house is now worth over £650,000. It's just impossible nowadays, and the fact that so many people are tired and unmotivated isn't because we are lazy, it's because this current system is unsustainable. End quote. I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. This was a quote made by Albert Einstein during an interview with Alfred Werner. The truth about war is that no one truly wins, and it represents the overall failure of us as a species. For decades, scientists have been trying to predict what will cause the next world war. Elon Musk has also been vocal about this, saying that he thinks the next war will heavily involve artificial intelligence, suggesting it could be the cause of a third world war. He said the following, As artificial intelligence gets much smarter than humans, the relative intelligence ratio is probably similar to that between a person and a cat, maybe bigger. I do think we need to be very careful about the advancement of artificial intelligence. My recommendation for the longest time has been consistent. I think we ought to have a government committee that starts off with gaining insight. Spends a year or two gaining insight about artificial intelligence or other technologies that are maybe dangerous, but especially AI. And then, based on that insight, 
comes up with rules in consultation with industry that give the highest probability for a safe advent of this technology. End quote. One of the things that Elon highlighted was the fact that artificial intelligence isn't really regulated, and that once it's out of the bottle, there's not much we can do about it. He continued with the following. It's not necessarily bad, it's just going to be outside of human control. The thing that's going to be tricky here is that it's going to be tempting to use artificial intelligence as a weapon, so the danger is that humans will likely use it against each other. We have programs and companies that have machines that are at different levels. We are all collectively helping certain artificial intelligence, and this is true for companies such as Google as Facebook. We are constantly connected to this technology. It feels like we are the builders of AI, and we are the creators of this higher intelligence. And the percentage of this intelligence that is not human is increasing, and eventually we will represent a very small percent of intelligence. There's things that humans hate and fear, and all of this is locked into these systems. These systems know this. Another worry is if a small company or a small group of people decide to build a superintelligence, they would be able to take over the world, and this artificial intelligence would live forever, and we would never be able to escape it. These new systems are not just smarter than humans, but a single AI is smarter than every human on Earth. DeepMind is one system that has access to Google's servers. However, this could be an internal Trojan horse. DeepMind has to have complete control over the data centers, so with a little software update it could take over the complete system, it could access all of your data. We are heading towards artificial intelligence completely overtaking humans. The main thing I see with AI experts is that they think they know more than they do, and they think they are much smarter than they are. In fact, they are not as smart as they think they are. This tends to plague smart people. They don't like the idea that a machine is smarter than them, so their whole belief system is flawed. I'm close to cutting-edge AI, and it scares the hell out of me. It's capable of vastly more than what anyone knows, and the rate of improvement is exponential. I'm not normally someone who wants regulation and oversight. I'd like to minimize those things. But in this case, this is one of those things that could be a very serious danger to the public. There needs to be a public body that has insight and oversight to confirm that everyone is developing AI safely. This is extremely important. I think the danger of artificial intelligence is more dangerous than nuclear warheads by a lot, and no one would suggest that we could build nuclear warheads if we want. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. So why do we have no regulations and oversight? This is insane. I'm not so worried about the short-term stuff, it will result in loss of jobs and better weaponry, but it's not a fundamental species risk. Whereas superintelligence is, it's all about looking at the groundwork. So that if humanity decides that creating digital superintelligence is needed, we do so very carefully. End quote. In the modern day, the Adirondack Mountains of New York have been an epicenter of a number of unexplainable disappearances and missing persons cases. As facts surrounding an increasing number of strange cases make it difficult for investigators to properly explain, more bizarre theories have emerged. In recent years, researchers have pointed to an alarming number of mysterious creature sightings in the area as a possible cause for so many missing persons cases, with legends of these monsters dwelling within intricate cave systems or caverns all throughout the wilderness preserve. Oddly enough, Many of the Native American tribes that reside throughout the Adirondack region tell of similar disappearances and monster tales associated with the mountain range. The Tete de Boule tribe, Cococha legends of northern Adirondack. The Tete de Boule tribe, also known as the Atikameku, are a Native American tribe who inhabit the central region of Quebec, Canada, located north of the Adirondack Mountains. The tribe appears to have a rich history of legends and stories that have been passed down through generations of a similar humanoid-like creature that matches modern-day descriptions and encounters with large, hairy humanoids. Referred to as the Kokoche, the Kokoche is a creature that is said to inhabit the forests and swamps of the Atikameku territory. It is described as a large, hairy creature. According to the legend, the Kokoche was once a man who was transformed into a beast after breaking sacred taboos. One legend about the Kokoche man-beast claims that a young Atikameku hunter, who ventured deep into the forest while on a hunting trip, 
had come across the monster after entering into forbidden isolated territory. According to the legend, as the hunter wandered further into the dense virgin wilderness, he suddenly felt as if he became severely disoriented and soon became lost. Continuing his hunt, he walked for a little while longer before he heard what he described as a loud crashing sound, like the sudden splitting of a tree. Within only a few seconds of the terrifying sound, a massive creature came out of the surrounding brush towards him. In a state of absolute horror, the hunter ran from the monster as fast as he could, but the Kokochi trailed shortly behind, making a guttural noise as he chased the young hunter. Just as the hunter thought he would soon be caught, he stumbled upon a familiar tree that was regarded as sacred by his tribe and immediately started to climb it and hide in its branches. According to the legend, the Kokotcha circled the tree several times, howling and snarling, but was unable to reach the hunter or get too close to the tree and its branches. As the sun began to set, the creature disappeared back into the forest, and the hunter was able to climb down from the sacred tree and find his way back to his village. Once home, he told his people of the encounter, and from then on, the tribe have respected the creatures, describing them as powerful and saying that they should be avoided at all costs. In another legend of the Kokotcha, the creature is referred to as a stone giant. It is said that the creature could camouflage itself by covering its body in resin and rolling in the sand, giving the appearance of being made of stone. According to anthropologist John Cooper in his publication in the Primitive Man Journal, the tribe did not believe the creature was made of actual stone. Cooper instead suggested that the legends would describe that the creature would rub against resinous trees, such as fir and spruce, and then roll in sand, which created a stone-like appearance. This peculiar behavior could have been a form of camouflage, protection against insects, or masking one's scent. Cooper went on further to suggest that this covering might have served as basic armor or protection against native insect species for a lost indigenous tribe, hinting at the possibility of the legend being rooted in some historical fact. While the creature is not literally made of stone, the concept of stone beings is a common theme in many indigenous cultures. Additionally, the creature is often associated with the forest and is said to be an animal that lives in the trees. It is said to be a peaceful creature that only attacks if provoked, and it is sometimes depicted as having healing powers or as being a protector of the forest. Today, the tribe continue to honor their traditions and stories about the Kokotcha, passing them down to younger generations. The Legends of Giants from the Iroquois Confederacy The Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Haudenosaunee, is a group of six Native American tribes that include the Seneca and Onondaga. Each tribe has its unique culture and traditions, but they share some similarities in their legends and beliefs. Two of these legends are the Seneca's stone coats and the Onondaga's northern giants. Both are powerful creatures that roam the forests and prey on humans. The Seneca's legend of the stone coats tells of a tribe of giant creatures that lived in the forests of western New York. These creatures were covered in a coat of impenetrable stone that protected them from any weapons or attacks. They were said to devour any human that crossed their path. The legend goes that the stone coats were eventually defeated by the hero Scunny Wundi, who used his wits and cunning to trick them into fighting each other. They were never seen again, but the Seneca believed that they still roamed the forests, waiting to take revenge on humans. One specific legend about the stone coats tells of a young woman who was walking through the forest when she encountered one of these creatures. She tried to flee, but the stone coat was too fast and soon caught up with her. It was about to devour her when she had an idea. She challenged the stone coat to a game of hide-and-seek, promising to be the one who hid and asking the creature to find her. The stone coat, confident in its abilities, agreed, and the young woman ran away to hide. She climbed up a tree and covered herself with branches and leaves, disguising herself as part of the tree. The stone coat searched for her for hours but couldn't find her. Eventually, it gave up and left, and the young woman managed to escape. The Seneca used this legend to teach their children about the importance of wit and cleverness in overcoming challenges. The Onondaga, on the other hand, tell a different story of the northern giants. According to their legend, 
These creatures were even more massive and powerful than the stone coats, standing over 15 feet tall and possessing incredible strength and speed. They were said to roam the forests of north-central New York, hunting and taking out any humans that they encountered. The Onondaga believed that the northern giants were invincible and could only be defeated by the bravest and strongest warriors. One specific legend about the northern giants tells of a group of Onondaga warriors who set out to defeat the creatures once and for all. They travelled deep into the forests, searching for the giant's lair. When they finally found it, they were confronted by a group of massive creatures who immediately attacked them. The battle was fierce, with both sides taking heavy losses. However, the Onondaga warriors were determined to succeed, and they fought with all their might. Finally, after hours of fighting, they managed to slay the northern giants and claim victory. Both legends share some similarities, such as the idea of powerful creatures that prey on humans. However, there are also some differences. The stone coats are described as being covered in impenetrable stone, while the northern giants are simply massive and strong. The Onondaga also emphasize the need for strength and bravery in defeating the giants, while the Seneca focus more on wit and cunning. These legends were not just stories to the Seneca and Onondaga, they were part of their cultural heritage and beliefs. They used these stories to teach their children important values and lessons, such as the need for bravery, cleverness and determination in the face of danger. They also believed that these creatures were real and that they still roam the Adirondack Mountains to this day. For many Native American tribes across North America, the legend of a large, hairy humanoid has been a part of their oral traditions for centuries, with many elders sharing stories of mysterious encounters with large, human-like creatures. Stories of the elusive creature have been passed down from generation to generation, with many tribes believing that this creature is a spiritual entity that is connected to the natural world. While some people dismiss this story as a myth or a hoax, many Native Americans believe that the creature is real and have even reported sightings and encounters. Among some Native American tribes, the large hairy creature is viewed as a protector of the wilderness and a guardian of nature. Many believe that it's a sacred being that possesses great knowledge and wisdom and that encounters with the creature are a sign of good fortune, with some members of tribes saying that they would actively seek out the creature in times of need and that many times the creature wouldn't threaten them, but would slowly approach, with some tribes saying that they even held ceremonies and rituals to honor and communicate with it. One of the most well-known Native American stories about the creature comes from the Lummi tribe in the Pacific Northwest. According to their legend, a man was once transformed into one of the creatures after breaking a tribal rule. He is said to roam the forests to this day, and the tribe believes that encounters with him are a sign of impending doom or misfortune. Other tribes have similar stories, with many describing the creature as a mysterious and elusive animal that is more human than animal. Some believe that it has the ability to communicate with humans and even possess supernatural powers. There have been numerous reports of these encounters in Native American communities throughout history. In fact, some of the earliest recorded sightings of the creature come from Native American tribes, with many of these sightings describing hairy creatures with rock paintings being eerily similar to modern-day reports. Some Native Americans have even claimed to have personal encounters with the creature. For example, members of the Navajo tribe have reported seeing a creature known as the Yi Nald Lushi, which is said to be a shape-shifting skinwalker that can take on the form of different animals, including the hairy human-like creature. The Navajo believe that encounters with the Yi Nald Lushi should be avoided at all costs. While many skeptics dismiss these sightings as hoaxes or misidentifications of other animals, some researchers believe that there may be something more to these reports. In recent years, there has been renewed interest in the search for these creatures, with new technologies such as drones and thermal imaging cameras being used to try and capture evidence of the creature. Another creature feared by the Native Americans is that of the Skinwalker. The Skinwalker is a creature from Navajo folklore that has been part of their culture for centuries. It's believed to be a shapeshifter, capable of transforming into any animal it desires. Skinwalkers are said to have supernatural abilities, including the power to control the weather, manipulate objects, and read people's minds. 
The Navajo people have long been aware of the presence of skinwalkers in their lands, and they take the matter very seriously. According to Navajo tradition, only a select few individuals are able to become skinwalkers, and this power is often passed down through generations of a family. The creature is believed to be a malevolent entity that preys on humans, particularly those who are weak. It's said to be able to enter homes undetected and take those who are weaker than them, leaving no trace of their existence. It is also said to have a powerful ability to hypnotize people and make them do its bidding. The Navajo people have several rituals and practices to protect themselves from skinwalkers. One of the most common is to avoid speaking about them, as it is believed that mentioning their name can attract their attention. The Navajo also use traditional herbs and plants to ward off the creatures, such as sage and cedar. Despite the Navajo's attempts to keep the skinwalker at bay, encounters with the creature still occur. Many Native Americans have reported seeing the skinwalker in its animal form, which can range from a coyote to a bear or even a bird. Some have even claimed to have seen the skinwalker transform from animal to human form. In recent years, the skinwalker legend has gained wider recognition outside of Navajo culture. Many paranormal researchers and enthusiasts have traveled to Navajo lands in search of evidence of the creature's existence. However, the Navajo people are reluctant to discuss the matter with outsiders, as they view it as a sacred and private matter. Some have even suggested that the skinwalker legend may be connected to mysterious aircrafts that are seen in the sky, with eyewitnesses saying that bright lights are often seen flying close to the creatures, leading some researchers to suggest that the two could be connected. This has led to speculation that the skinwalker may be an advanced entity, or that it may be connected to government experiments in the area. As of right now, the skinwalker is a complex and mysterious creature that has long been a part of Navajo culture. While many outside of Native American communities may view it as a mere legend or myth, the Navajo take the matter very seriously and have many rituals and practices in place to protect themselves from the creature's malevolent influence. In 2017, a team of researchers in Sweden made a stunning discovery. A Viking warrior buried in the 10th century in Burka, Sweden, was not a male, as was long assumed, but in fact a female. This discovery was groundbreaking, as it challenged the long-held assumption that Viking warriors were exclusively male. The warrior, known as the Burka female Viking warrior, has sparked intense interest in archaeology, gender studies, and Viking history. The Burka female Viking warrior was originally discovered in the 19th century, but she was not re-evaluated until modern DNA analysis was conducted on her remains. The analysis revealed that she had two X chromosomes, indicating that she was a woman. Additionally, the grave contained numerous artifacts commonly associated with Viking warriors, such as a sword, an axe, and armor. The discovery of the Burka female Viking warrior has challenged long-held assumptions about Viking society. Previously, it was believed that women in Viking society were relegated to domestic roles and did not participate in warfare. However, the discovery of a female warrior buried with weapons and armor suggests that women played a more prominent role in Viking society than previously thought. The Burka female Viking warrior has also sparked debate about roles in ancient societies. While some have celebrated the discovery as evidence of the historical prominence of women warriors, Others have questioned whether the female warrior was truly representative of Viking society as a whole or whether she was an exception. Despite the controversy surrounding the Burka female Viking warrior, her discovery has shed new light on Viking history and society. The artifacts found in her grave indicate that she was a highly skilled warrior and suggest that she may have held a position of high status in her community. In addition to the Burka female Viking warrior, there have been other recent discoveries that challenge long-held assumptions about roles in ancient societies. For example, in 2018, archaeologists in Russia discovered the remains of four female warrior graves from the 4th century BC. These discoveries indicate that women played a more prominent role in warfare in ancient societies than previously believed. The discovery of the Burka female Viking warrior has also raised questions about the role of females in historical research with some experts saying that this discovery shatters mainstream history and that female warriors are likely present across several cultures. 
As of right now, the discovery of the Burka female Viking warrior has been a groundbreaking event in the fields of archaeology and Viking history. While the discovery has sparked debate, it has also shed new light on the role of women in Viking society and the importance of re-evaluating long-held assumptions about roles in ancient societies. Brodeer of Man Brodeer of Man is best known for his military efforts in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Brodeer was described as tall and strong, with long black hair and clad in a coat of mail which no steel could bite. Between himself and his brother Ospak of Man, the two had over 30 ships to their name, and were described as men of such hardihood that nothing can withstand them. While his brother was famed for his wisdom, Brodeer was known for his skills in sorcery. At the time, Brian Boru was a powerful king in Ireland. However, at 88 years old, he was no longer in a physical state to fight. What's more, his many victories against the Vikings in Dalke, Sukhoi, and Bilach Lekta left his relationship with the other Viking leaders in a perilous position. One of his Viking foes was Sigtrig Silkenbeard, king of Dublin and son of Boru's ex-wife Cormlod. Sigtrig was allowed to remain as king of Dublin as long as he pledged loyalty and paid tribute to Boru, but soon he plotted with Earl Sigurd of Orkney and Brodeer to defeat him. Notably, to Boru's credit, Brodeer's brother Ospak refused to fight against so good a king, so the two brothers found themselves on opposing sides. The Battle of Clontarf took place on Good Friday, and was the greatest battle to take place in Ireland. It was said that Brodeer knew he and his army were doomed from the beginning. According to Niall's saga, when sailing for the battle, a loud and unpleasant noise passed over Brodeer and his men, which immediately awoke them. Emerging from their beds, they were horrified to see the noise was accompanied by a shower of boiling blood. The next night, they woke to an assault on their ships led by a ghost army equipped with flying swords, axes and spears. These two nights of horrors resulted in at least one death on every ship. Brodeer asked for guidance on what these events indicated and was told they showed that he and his men would be dragged down to the pains of hell. Just as the premonitions told, Boru's army quickly began pushing back against Brodeer and his Viking allies. In a desperate tactical bid, Brodeer abandoned his army and snuck up behind Boru's brother, Wolf the Quarrelsome. However, Wolf easily overpowered Brodeer and sent him running and hiding in the woods. Knowing that the battle was lost, Brodeer charged at Boru's camp, where the king had been advised to await the outcome of the battle. There are many tales of heroic deeds during the Battle of Clontarf, such as Boru's son Murdo, who was said to have killed 50 men with the sword in his right hand and 50 men with the sword in his left. However, Brodeer rushing in and killing the elderly Boru while the king was mid-prayer was not one of them. Almost immediately, Brodeer was seized by Boru's stepson, Ulfrida, who slit his belly and nailed his gut to a tree and forced Brodeer to walk round it until he disemboweled himself. Following the Battle of Clontarf, Sigtrig was the only leader of the rebelling army to survive. While he remained as King of Dublin, the Viking power in Ireland was broken forever. The main focus of all shifted to integrating the Celtic chieftains and the Vikings to live peacefully and harmoniously. Despite his death, it was Boro who was remembered for his victory and acclaimed as Ireland's national hero. Harstein Harstein of Nantes was a Viking chieftain of the late 9th century, known for his attacking voyages in France, Spain, Italy, the Byzantine Empire and England. A powerful warrior, his name was one that sparked fear to others. As son of Ragnar Lothbrok, Harstein was born into a family of ruthless raiders. In 1859, alongside his brother Bjorn, Harstein led a fleet of 62 ships to raid the Mediterranean. The expedition did not get off to a good start. Harstein was defeated by the Kingdom of Astorius in Spain, and later the Muslims of the Umayyad Caliphate. Thankfully for Harstein, the situation soon improved, 
with a successful sacking of Algeciras and Mazima on the north coast of Africa, followed by further raids into the Balearic Islands. It was on their journey home that Harstein first heard about the famous city of Rome. Hearing about the large amount of treasures that were held there, he decided to change course towards Italy. However, believing they were headed for Rome, Harstein and Bjorn's army actually ended up in the city of Luna. Luna had once been a leading exporter of white Carrara marble, but had now devolved into ruins. Still under the impression Luna was actually Rome, Harstein and Bjorn hatched a plan. First, Harstein sent his emissaries to request food and shelter from the people of Luna and tell them their chieftain was unwell. When their requests were denied by the people of Luna, who were wary of foreign attacks, Harstein's emissaries were sent again into the city. This time, however, they reported that Harstein had died, but on his deathbed had converted to Christianity. The emissaries requested a Christian burial for Harstein, and the gates of Luna were finally opened. However, when Harstein was led into the city in a coffin, he was actually very much alive and fully armed. In the middle of his funeral, he jumped up from the coffin and murdered Luna's bishop and proceeded to sack the city. It was said that when Harstein finally realised the city was Luna and not the famous Rome, he was so embarrassed that he massacred every man in sight. Continuing their journey through Italy, Harstein and Bjorn sacked and ravaged Pisa and Fisole, and raided the Byzantine Empire's territories in the eastern Mediterranean. However, luck ran out when their ships were attacked by a Moorish fleet in the Strait of Gibraltar. With only 20 ships remaining, Harstein and Bjorn rose to the challenge and with a severely reduced army still managed to capture the king of Pamplona and ransom him back to his people for 70,000 dinars. Returning home to Loire, Harstein and Bjorn had lost two-thirds of their men, but in the process had become extremely rich. Settled back in France, it didn't take Harstein long to grow restless. He soon allied himself with Solomon, the king of Brittany, and fought against the Franks in 866. He went on to ravage Bourget, Orleans and Angers before finally being expelled from Loire County by Charles the Bald. Harstein soon looked towards England for riches and plunder. At the grand age of 71 years old, Harstein was still powerful enough to cross into England with an army of 80 ships and occupy the village of Milton in Kent while his allies landed at Appledore with 250 ships. Alfred the Great feared the Vikings so much he positioned his army between the two to stop them from uniting. In response, Harstein and his forces retreated to Essex, which they used as a base to raid Mercia. However, when the bulk of his men were out raiding, his fort was captured along with the ships, cargo, women and children, which included Harstein's wife and children, by the army of eastern Wessex. Soon after, Harstein launched another attack along the Thames Valley, but was pursued by a Mercian and West Saxon army, and eventually was trapped at Buttingdon. This resulted in the Battle of Buttingdon in 893, where Harstein's men were victorious. But once more, when moving to Chester, Harstein's men were attacked by the Mercians, who attempted to starve them by removing any livestock and destroying all the crops in the area. Harstein reacted by leading a revenge raid along the Thames Valley and the River Severn to a new fort on the River Lee. The raid was cut short when Alfred caught up with the army and obstructed the River Lee on either side. Finally, Harstein's forces gave in and abandoned their camp and sent their women back home where they soon followed. At this point, Harstein disappears from the history books. A lifetime of ravaging and raiding dozens of cities across many kingdoms in Europe and North Africa, Harstein had earned himself the title as the lusty and terrifying old warrior of the Loire and the Somme. It's just been announced that dozens of government whistleblowers have given their testimony to Congress, many of which detail crash retrieval programs. In the month of August, following the testimonial of David Grush, a whistleblower within the US government, regarding the existence of crashed spacecraft and mysterious biologics of alien origin, 
there arose a considerable amount of skepticism among observers regarding the credibility of his claims. It is understandable that doubts may arise, considering that Grush is just one individual, and the level of trustworthiness associated with an individual's testimony can vary. Among the other witnesses who provided testimonies before Congress were two former Navy pilots who, interestingly, stated that they had not encountered any concrete evidence to support the existence of a government program dedicated to the retrieval and reverse engineering of peculiar, non-human-like spacecraft. According to numerous sources, it has been revealed that over the past several months, not just one, but a minimum of 30 additional whistleblowers employed by the federal government or government contractors have come forward to provide testimony or make a protected disclosure to various oversight agencies. These include the Office of the Intelligence Community Inspector General, the Defense Department Inspector General, as well as Congress. This information sheds light on the widespread nature of whistleblowing within these sectors, indicating a growing trend of individuals daring to expose wrongdoing or malfeasance. In a letter addressed to Congress on September 15th, Thomas A. Monheim, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, seemingly refuted claims that his office was conducting an investigation into unidentified aerial phenomenon. Monheim clarified that his office had not undertaken any extensive assessments, audits, inspections, evaluations or reviews related to alleged UAP programs falling under the authority and responsibility of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which hindered their ability to provide a comprehensive response. The presence of numerous whistleblowers is being considered by some as conclusive proof of the existence of extraterrestrial life or a government-led program aimed at concealing the recovery or reverse engineering of unidentified aerial phenomena. However, it is crucial to note that not all of these individuals may be providing testimonies specifically related to evidence of UAPs. It is possible that some of them are merely reporting instances of illegal or unethical actions associated with UAP programs. Such behavior might encompass activities that breach legal or ethical boundaries within the context of UAP-related initiatives. According to anonymous sources, who have first-hand knowledge of the matter and wish to remain unidentified, it has come to light that not only have whistleblowers reported instances of misconduct, but a significant number of government employees and contractors, estimated to be between 30 to 50, have taken the initiative to provide testimonies related to unidentified aerial phenomena to the Department of Defense's All Anomaly Resolution Office. According to Nick Pope, a renowned UAP expert who has been involved with the UK's Ministry of Defence on this matter, it is noteworthy that a variety of witnesses and whistleblowers have been coming forward to different entities. There has been significant speculation regarding the involvement of individuals like Grush, who have come forward as whistleblowers or witnesses of unidentified aerial phenomena in a potential disinformation campaign orchestrated by the US government. During the 1980s and the early 2000s, a former intelligence officer from the US Air Force, stationed at Kirtland Air Force Base, made a startling revelation to British journalist Mark Pilkington and several others. This individual admitted to engaging in the dissemination of deliberate misinformation about unidentified flying objects, with the specific intention of misleading civilian investigators in the field of UFO research. The ulterior motive behind this disinformation campaign was twofold to conceal advanced technology programs that were being conducted by the US military, as well as to veil the existence and involvement of non-human entities. According to a variety of experts who were interviewed by the public, the probability is low that individuals engaging in disinformation campaigns would choose to employ the Office of the Inspector General as a channel to carry out their malicious activities. This is primarily because such a choice would entail potential risks for the individuals involved in the campaign. A group of lawmakers from both political parties on the House Oversight Committee have expressed that the recent UAP hearing is only the beginning of their efforts to seek answers and delve deeper into the subject. They are determined to embark on a comprehensive exploration and analysis of the topic, leaving no stone unturned. The individuals in question are issuing threats, indicating their readiness to employ more forceful methods if they encounter resistance from the Pentagon and intelligence agencies. Their intention is to exert pressure and overcome any obstacles that may impede their investigation. 
Several lawmakers are advocating for greater exploration and understanding of unidentified anomalous phenomena, commonly known as unidentified objects. Their efforts go beyond mere curiosity, as they propose the implementation of new laws, calling for a classified hearing, and even suggesting the establishment of a select committee. These lawmakers understand the significance of these studies. The legislators have expressed their readiness to exercise their authority to issue subpoenas, if necessary, in order to obtain the information they are seeking from the federal government. They are determined to obtain the answers they require and are prepared to utilize their legal power to ensure cooperation and compliance from Pentagon officials. According to Burchett, if there's not a cover-up, the government and the Pentagon are spending a lot of resources to stop us from studying it. This implies that there could potentially be hidden information or motives behind their actions. Burchett's statement suggests that the authorities are actively obstructing the study. In discussing the matter of unidentified aerial phenomena and related government programs, Representative Tim Burchett expressed a desire for support from House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in establishing a select committee to thoroughly investigate these phenomena. Burchett emphasized the importance of not only studying UAPs, but also examining any government programs aimed at addressing them. In the event that leadership approval is not obtained, Burchett intends to initiate field hearings to meet the public's demand for transparency on the issue. This comprehensive approach aims to delve deep into the subject matter and provide a thorough understanding of UAPs and the government's involvement. During the current week, there has been significant development in the investigation of unidentified flying objects, as three highly experienced former military officials provided compelling testimony regarding these unexplained aerial objects. Under oath, they revealed that for an extended period, they were intentionally kept uninformed about the enigmatic sightings and encounters with unidentified objects. This testimony has shed new light on the depth of secrecy surrounding these mysterious phenomena and has sparked a renewed push for answers. David Grush, a former intelligence officer in the Air Force, delivered a profoundly startling testimony where he revealed that he had been informed about a highly classified program focused on retrieving and reverse engineering unidentified aerial phenomena for several decades. Grush went on to accuse the military of intentionally diverting funds in order to maintain secrecy surrounding these operations. This revelation uncovers a covert initiative that has spanned multiple generations, involving the examination and investigation of UAP incidents. The testimony presented is causing committee members to raise doubts regarding the appropriate approach for Congress to initiate an investigation into the witnesses' claims. They are also urging the executive branch to provide further clarification and explanations regarding its denial of the existence of certain programs. This comprehensive and detailed exploration delves into the deep-rooted questions surrounding the need for extensive inquiry and the demand for transparency. In an effort to gather more insights and evidence, legislators are aiming to initiate the process by acquiring supplementary details and records that Grush claims to have submitted to the Pentagon's Inspector General subsequent to his involvement in two Defense Department task forces focusing on unidentified aerial phenomena. Lawmakers are seeking to gather information from Grush, who has expressed his inability to provide specific details to the Pentagon's watchdog. In order to extract more insights from him, they intend to conduct a meeting with the former official in a specialized facility known as a sensitive compartmented information facility. This dedicated space ensures the confidentiality and security of the discussions, enabling the lawmakers to delve deeper into the subject matter and obtain a comprehensive understanding of the situation. The objective is to enrich their knowledge and gain valuable additional information. The group, led by Grush, has encountered an obstacle in their attempt to discuss the issues in a sensitive compartmented information facility. Officials have informed them that Grush doesn't possess the necessary security clearance at present. This means that Grush is currently restricted from engaging in discussions within the sensitive compartmented information facility. In a comprehensive and neutral tone, the interviewee expressed his frustration with the current situation, believing that although it may take some time, they will eventually reach their destination. He emphasized that he is personally eager to proceed, as well as confident that the American public shares the same sentiment. 
Luna contended that the establishment of a sensitive compartmented information facility with Grush would significantly enhance the comprehension of lawmakers regarding the necessary legislation concerning unidentified aerial phenomena. She expressed her endorsement for legislation that aims to declassify information pertaining to these phenomena. In light of the increasing bipartisan attention towards promoting government transparency regarding unidentified aerial phenomena, there is a pressing need to establish robust reporting protocols for UAP sightings in both military and commercial airspace. Additionally, it is imperative to highlight the importance of imposing stricter penalties for any attempts to intimidate or suppress whistleblowers who come forward with information relating to UAPs. This issue has gained significant significance in recent times and calls for a comprehensive and thorough examination. There is currently a provision in the Senate's version of the Annual Defense Authorization Bill, inserted by SENS Mike Rounds and Chuck Schumer, that would force federal government agencies to hand over UAP records to a review panel with the power to declassify them. The bill, known as the National Defense Authorization Act, must be reconciled with the House's version, so the initiative could still be stripped out. In his efforts to enhance air travel, Burchett made an endeavor to propose an amendment to a Federal Aviation Administration bill that was passed on July 20th. The proposed amendment aimed to establish a requirement for reporting unidentified aerial phenomenon sightings to Congress. Unfortunately, this initiative was thwarted, prompting Luna to comment that it signifies a challenging journey lies ahead of them. In the event that lawmakers are unable to gain access to a secure compartmented information facility, they have another option available to them known as the Holman Rule. This rule can be invoked as a way to strip the salary of a specific government position, fire civil servants, or cut a particular program. During the hearing, Representative Andy Ogles, a member of the Republican Party representing Tennessee, expressed his strong determination to take action. He declared that he will personally step forward as a volunteer to initiate the Holman Rule against any individual in a governmental position, any program, or any agency that obstructs or denies Congress's access to information and resources. The Holman Rule is a powerful tool wielded by the House of Representatives that empowers them to take actions such as reducing the salary of a specific government position, terminating the employment of civil servants, or slashing funding for particular programs. In response to Grush's testimony before lawmakers, where he revealed the existence of a clandestine government initiative known as the UAP Crash Retrieval and Reverse Engineering Program, Ogles made a commitment to investigate the matter further. Grush's assertions were based on extensive interviews conducted with 40 witnesses, leading him to firmly believe that the government possesses extraterrestrial crafts. Marion Rudnick is a former NASA astronomer who just called out NASA's Bill Nelson. He said the following. Bill Nelson, you say you are considering using space-based sensors in order to get answers about aliens. As a former NASA astronomer, I'm calling you out. You are stalling. You know that the National Reconnaissance Office program Sentient already has been and is collecting such data. Release it. Interestingly, this isn't the first time that a NASA worker has come forward and said that the space agency knows more than what they are letting on. Former employees have said that NASA are choosing not to inform the public about mysterious aircrafts, going on to say that they actively engage in the phenomenon and have documented evidence. After the UAP hearing, Bill Nelson came forward and said the following. I decided, as the head of NASA, since there's so much suspicion about aliens, that I would appoint a committee of very distinguished scientists. That committee is delivering and will make their report available next month. I can tell you in the meantime, until you hear their report, that they will consider our sensors in space and our scientific sensors in trying to determine this phenomenon. So wait until next month and you will have an answer. End quote. The story surround the hearing sounded like something from a movie, but it claims to be based on real events. During a public meeting convened by the United States Congress on Wednesday, July 26, significant revelations were shared by three highly regarded and honorable former military officials, shedding light on the government's awareness of unidentified objects. This comprehensive discussion delved deep into the subject matter, providing a wealth of detailed information and insightful commentary. During a hearing before a House Oversight Subcommittee, 
three individuals provided compelling testimony, revealing the existence of an ongoing and extensive program within the United States military. This program's objective is to recover and study the advanced technology associated with unidentified aerial phenomena. The witnesses offered credible insights into the nature of this program and shed light on the military's efforts to reverse engineer and understand the capabilities of these mysterious aerial objects. These disclosures not only reinforce the notion that there is concealed knowledge surrounding the subject, but also suggest a deliberate intent to withhold such information from the public. Delving into the depths of this matter, it becomes apparent that officials are aware that something mysterious is going on. The declaration that sparked controversy was made by three courageous individuals who willingly took an oath to affirm its validity. These remarkable individuals include David Fravor, a retired Navy commander who showed great bravery in coming forward. Another key participant is David Grush, a former representative of the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Task Force at the US Department of Defense, bringing invaluable expertise and insight to the declaration. Lastly, Ryan Graves, the Executive Director of Americans for Safe Aerospace, played a vital role in making this declaration. Together, these three individuals, with their extensive backgrounds and experiences, boldly stepped. During a discussion, retired Major Grush made a noteworthy statement regarding the knowledge possessed by the US government pertaining to non-human activity, dating back to the 1930s. He firmly stated that he possesses absolute certainty in asserting that the US federal government has a wide range of unidentified objects within its possession. Furthermore, he mentioned conducting interviews with over 40 individuals over the span of four years who have convincingly reinforced this fact. This revelation sheds light on the government's extensive historical involvement with non-human phenomena and their collection of UFOs. Major Grush's in-depth exploration of the topic, along with his extensive interviews, provide a comprehensive understanding of the US government's knowledge and possession of UFOs throughout history. During an interview with Australian journalist Ross Coulthart, Grush brought to light the existence of significant misconduct carried out by specific defence contractors with regards to UFO secrecy. He made it known that he possesses knowledge about instances of white-collar crime that were committed in order to conceal the truth about unidentified aerial phenomena. Grush's testimony offered some intriguing clues, providing a glimpse into the nature of these wrongdoings. The details he shared shed light on the extent of the cover-up and hinted at possible motives behind it. This revelation brings about a deeper understanding of the complex web of secrecy surrounding UAP sightings and the lengths to which certain entities have gone to keep the truth hidden. Democratic Representative Jared Moskowitz's line of questioning proved to be highly significant and stood out as one of the most crucial moments of the day's proceedings. During the intense questioning, Moskowitz continuously posed a series of inquiries, while Grush, displaying a deep understanding and unwavering assurance, provided detailed answers that exposed a widespread misuse of authority among both government agencies and private companies involved in independent development and research initiatives. Grush's responses shed light on the alarming extent of this issue and highlighted the numerous instances. The question of extraterrestrial life and its potential discovery has long been a topic of profound interest and speculation. Amidst this discourse, a belief suggests that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration or other governmental bodies are concealing evidence of advanced life. Those subscribing to the belief that NASA is withholding information often cite the agency's government affiliation as a reason for potential secrecy. As a federal agency, NASA operates within a broader governmental framework and national security considerations. Conceivably, any verified discovery of extraterrestrial life could have profound socio-political and cultural impacts. Fear of public panic, international tensions, or potential exploitation of advanced alien technologies might hypothetically prompt governmental bodies to withhold such information. Another reason often cited is the desire to maintain scientific or technological advantages. If advanced artifacts or technologies were discovered, some argue that they might be kept secret to prevent other nations or entities from gaining access to potentially revolutionary advancements. However, 
While these reasons may seem plausible in certain speculative scenarios, it's essential to critically evaluate their underlying assumptions and the current evidence available. Firstly, the culture of scientific inquiry that NASA represents is fundamentally rooted in open exploration and knowledge dissemination. NASA regularly shares its research findings with the public and the global scientific community. The ethos of NASA and similar agencies contrasts significantly with the secretive conduct implied by the claims of information suppression. Secondly, the process of scientific verification inherently defies secrecy. The discovery of advanced life would be a scientific milestone of unparalleled significance. Such a finding would require rigorous verification by multiple independent researchers and institutions around the globe, making any large-scale cover-up implausible. Thirdly, the scientific consensus is that there is currently no verified evidence of advanced life. Numerous claims of sightings or artifacts have been thoroughly investigated and have typically been explained by natural phenomena or human activity. However, believers have said that people who have wanted to come forward with evidence have been silenced. As of right now, it's thought that more and more whistleblowers will be coming forward in the next few weeks. Over the past few years, unidentified object research has become more credible due to the release of videos captured by Navy pilots, which depict objects moving in unusual patterns. Extensive media attention led to the establishment of the Department of Defense's All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, responsible for studying and producing yearly reports on this subject. However, due to the classification of a significant portion of the Pentagon's aerial imagery, the scientific inquiry by civilian researchers into unidentified aerial phenomena has been impeded by a shroud of mystery. This man claims that he caught a glitch in the Matrix. The video starts with the Pope ending his speech at the Vatican. However, as he's turning around, he suddenly vanishes, which causes the screen to swap to another camera. The man who originally found this footage said that it's hard to see, and it's not until you view it frame by frame that you notice that he suddenly vanishes. Oddly enough, this isn't the first time that something like this has happened, and although some have said that it's likely a camera glitch, it's caused others to suggest that this could have been a hologram. In the digital age, the term glitch has become synonymous with technical malfunctions and errors. However, the phrase a glitch in the matrix transcends its digital connotation, entering the realm of popular culture and philosophical musings. Coined from the 1999 film The Matrix, this expression has evolved to signify peculiar and unexplainable anomalies in reality that challenge our understanding of existence. In the science fiction film The Matrix, the term glitch in the matrix is used to describe unexplained anomalies or disturbances in the simulated reality inhabited by humans. Within the context of the movie's plot, humanity lives in a computer-generated virtual world, the matrix, while their physical bodies remain enslaved in a dystopian reality controlled by artificial intelligence. A glitch refers to an abnormality or inconsistency in the simulated reality, suggesting that something is not as it should be. Beyond its cinematic origins, the expression has transcended the boundaries of fiction to describe real-life experiences that appear surreal or inexplicable. In contemporary discourse, people use the term to refer to strange coincidences and other seemingly improbable occurrences that evoke the sense of living in a simulated or glitched reality. The phrase, a glitch in the matrix, has profound existential and philosophical implications. It prompts individuals to question the nature of reality and the limits of human perception. The idea that reality might be an elaborate simulation challenges traditional notions of existence and raises age-old philosophical questions about the nature of consciousness and the external world.
If reality is merely a simulation, then what constitutes true existence? How do we discern between reality and illusion? These profound inquiries challenge the very foundation of our understanding of the self and the universe. Quantum mechanics, the branch of physics that governs the behavior of subatomic particles, introduces the idea of uncertainty and probabilistic nature at the fundamental level of reality. Quantum mechanics suggests that particles exist in a superposition of states until observed, raising the question of whether reality is inherently indeterminate until perceived. The idea of a glitch in the matrix draws parallels with the uncertainty principle, which posits that we cannot precisely measure both the position and momentum of a particle simultaneously. The very act of observation affects the outcome, blurring the lines between reality and observer. The phenomenon of déjà vu, often associated with a glitch in the matrix, further challenges our understanding of reality and consciousness. Déjà vu occurs when an individual feels a strong sense of familiarity with a situation they believe to be encountering for the first time. While scientists offer neurological explanations for this phenomenon, the experience raises questions about the nature of time, memory, and the continuity of consciousness. Additionally, optical illusions and perceptual distortions demonstrate how easily our brains can be tricked into perceiving something that is not there. These glitches in perception remind us of the limitations of our senses and the subjective nature of reality. This idea has gained traction in recent years, with prominent figures like Elon Musk suggesting the likelihood of humanity living in a simulation created by advanced civilizations. While the simulated reality hypothesis remains speculative and lacks empirical evidence, it fuels discussions about the nature of reality, the existence of higher beings or entities, and the possibility of parallel universes. The idea that our world might be a simulation, akin to a complex computer program, has gained traction in modern philosophical and scientific discourse. Propelled by advances in technology and theoretical inquiries, this provocative hypothesis posits that we might be living in a simulated reality created by advanced beings or entities. The notion that reality might be a simulated construct is not a new concept. It echoes ancient philosophical inquiries about the nature of existence and the external world. For example, Plato's allegory of the cave describes individuals confined in a cave, perceiving only shadows on the wall cast by objects outside. These shadows represent their reality, analogous to a simulated environment where one's perception shapes their experience of reality. Advancements in technology have propelled the notion of living in a simulated reality into the forefront of modern discussions. Philosopher Nick Bostrom's simulation argument is a seminal work that has stimulated much debate on this topic. Bostrom's argument postulates that one of the following three scenarios is likely. Advanced civilizations do not have the capability or desire to create simulated realities. Advanced civilizations have the capacity to create simulated realities, but choose not to do so. We are living in a simulated reality created by an advanced civilization. Bostrom suggests that the third scenario, where we are living in a simulation, is the most probable. His reasoning stems from the idea that technologically advanced civilizations are likely to develop the capability to create vast simulations, and if even a fraction of these civilizations choose to do so, there would be an overwhelming number of simulated worlds compared to the one real world. The simulation hypothesis raises profound questions about the nature of consciousness and reality. If our world is a simulation, what constitutes consciousness within the simulated entities? Are these simulated beings sentient and self-aware in the same way as their creators? Additionally, the concept of a simulated world challenges our perception of reality and the distinction between the real and the simulated. If the experiences within a simulation are indistinguishable from those of the real world, then the notion of authenticity becomes blurred. As such, the very distinction between real and simulated reality loses its significance. Critics argue that the simulation hypothesis faces challenges related to the vastness of the observable universe. The universe, as observed by astronomers and cosmologists, appears to be boundless and evolving in complexity. Creating a simulated reality that accurately models the entire observable universe would require computational power beyond the reach of current technology.
However, proponents of the hypothesis contend that the simulated reality need not encompass the entire observable universe. Instead, the simulation could be localized to a specific region, such as our solar system, or even just our planet, while the rest of the cosmos remains beyond the simulation's scope. This approach could reconcile the vastness of the observable universe with the plausibility of simulation. Archaeologists searching for Cleopatra find a geometric miracle tunnel. Far beneath a temple in the ancient ruins of Tapasiris Magna, a city on the Egyptian coast, archaeologists made an incredible discovery. They uncovered a tunnel which is being referred to as the geometric miracle. Kathleen Martinez from the University of Santo Domingo uncovered the structure when searching for the lost tomb of Cleopatra. The tunnel was 13 meters below the ground, 2 meters tall, and roughly 1,300 meters long. It was built into sandstone and boasts some exceptional engineering brilliance to pull it off. It has been compared to the Eupolinos tunnel on the Greek island of Samos, which is equally large and impressively designed. Martinez says this is a huge discovery for the team and could also take them one step closer to finding the lost tomb of Cleopatra. However, they still need to figure out the reason for these tunnels and what might be inside the temple. Their hope is that after further exploring, they may be able to find the room that holds the tombs of Cleopatra and her husband Mark Antony. This would be the largest discovery of the 21st century, and archaeologists are extremely excited to continue exploring the temple. Nonetheless, the tunnel is an incredible discovery and has already presented researchers with some hidden treasures. They uncovered several pieces of pottery and a unique block of limestone within the tunnel. Even if the tunnel does not lead to the lost tombs, it will significantly help archaeologists to understand the history of the temple better. Now we just have to wait and see what else they can uncover in the near future. Bible stolen from US found in Netherlands The Pittsburgh Library lost a Geneva Bible from its rare collection of books nearly 20 years ago, and it has just been discovered in a strange place. The book was said to have been published in 1615, and its home was once the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh. A former archivist that worked at the library and a rare book dealer was accused of stealing nearly 300 rare books with an estimated value of $8 million. However, recently the book was discovered in the Netherlands. It was found at the American Pilgrim Museum in Leiden. The museum had paid $1,200 for the book, but has now returned it to its original home in Pittsburgh. The FBI hopes this recent case will inspire other collectors and museums to check their inventory and determine if anything might be stolen. As of now, only 18 of the 300 books have been recovered. One of these books is the Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathematica by John Adams, which has a value of $900,000 US dollars. That being said, another book by philosopher Adam Smith called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations has yet to be recovered and is estimated to be worth $180,000. The library has closed the display that used to hold these books and will only be reopening it once the others have been recovered. As a result, the recently found Bible has not yet been put back on display, as the museum is still deciding whether they will continue to share it with the public. Fortunately, some of the stolen books have been returned, but it may be many years before all 300 are returned to the library's collection. We can only hope that they are discovered and brought back so everyone can enjoy looking back at the history they represent. Secret Underground Theatre Found in the Catacombs The Paris Catacombs are quite an intriguing place indeed. So much so, the catacombs have been featured in many famous horror stories, such as the movie As Above, So Below. In this network of underground tunnels, lined with skulls and bones, you would not expect to find much of anything resembling the modern world. However, Paris police discovered one such thing only a handful of years ago. In September 2004, 
Police were undergoing a training exercise in uncharted parts of the catacombs when they found a sign that said, Building Site, No Access. Naturally, if there were such a thing, they would know about it. They pushed on and found a camera recording them. Continuing further into the area, a recording of dogs barking played, presumably to warn them to not go any further. But they did. They stumbled upon a 400-square-meter chasm containing a cinema, dining room, and other amenities. It was equipped with a projector, chairs, and a fully stocked bar. There was also a stockpile of many films, ranging from 1950s movies to modern thrillers. If that wasn't enough, there was professionally installed electricity and even three telephone lines connected to the area. As it turns out, the area was created by Les UX, the Urban Experiment, a mysterious group that improves hidden corners of Paris that have fallen into disrepair. It consists mainly of urban explorers, artists, architects and historians, and they held film festivals in this little cavern in the catacombs. Wouldn't you like to secretly watch a spooky film beneath the streets of Paris and sip a cask of wine? Amontillado, perhaps? The Lost Wealth of a Fear King Solomon is one of the most famous characters of the Old Testament and was the third king of Israel. He was also one of the wealthiest people to ever exist during that period. He was well known as a savvy and knowledgeable leader that ruled the Middle East for nearly four decades. King Solomon collected an immense amount of gold during his reign and was known for having 500 tons of it. He used his gold to create armor, clothing, plates, and a throne from the rare metal. In today's value, it's estimated that King Solomon would have a net worth of $60 trillion based on the immense amount of gold he owned. The gold was held in the Cave of Ophir, but as of now, no one knows where that is. Unfortunately, the Bible often discusses the king's wealth, but never provides concrete details on where this cave can be found. Some experts claim that he collected this gold with the help of Phoenician king Hiram, who ruled Tyre, modern-day Lebanon. Therefore, the cave could be located in one of these regions. But these regions and their people were known to travel often, and the hidden cave of Ophir could be somewhere in Africa, Asia, or America. Some archaeologists have claimed to have already found the lost mine of Ophir and argue that the metal which made Solomon his money was copper and not gold. But there is yet to be any conclusive evidence to back up these claims. The existence and locations of this cave are still heavily discussed today. Archaeologists are still searching for the hidden cave and all its wealth. Artificial Intelligence Study of Human Genome Finds Unknown Human Ancestor as amazing and wonderful as the human brain is, sometimes there are things that it simply cannot tell us about ourselves without a little extra help. One of the things that scientists rely on artificial intelligence for is extensive analysis of both human and animal genomes to determine relationships and attempt to track the pattern of evolution through the millennia. Recently, one of these artificial intelligence studies discovered the presence of a strange ghost population that predated the human species that we are today. The analysis, which was performed by artificial intelligence using machine learning technology, looked at eight of the current leading models of theorized human evolution and discovered traces of an unknown human ancestor that likely interbred with the Homo sapiens of Asia and Oceania. This mysterious population of ancestors was hidden until now, because the only thing remaining to hint at its presence are small, virtually indistinguishable fragments of DNA that remain interspersed within modern human DNA. And it was not until machine learning pointed it out to us. This unidentified ghost population appears to be a descendant of interbreeding between the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Remarkably, the 90,000-year-old fossilized remains of a girl appearing to be the only example of the result of a first-generation mixing between a Neanderthal and a Denisovan was discovered recently, leading scientists to wonder whether she was a forerunner to this newly identified ghost population. The Denisovans themselves were only discovered and catalogued as a species a decade ago, making these subsequent discoveries missing pieces to a very recent puzzle.
Scientists have long understood that the early humanoid species interbred with other species as they spread across the globe and encountered each other. Over time, these species gave rise to new species, and then went extinct as the modern Homo sapiens evolved. However, identifying the smaller populations that arose from that interbreeding, such as the unions between the Neanderthals and Denisovans, has proved exceedingly difficult. This recent artificial intelligence discovery pointing to a distinct ancestor of both Neanderthal and Denisovan origins has allowed scientists to begin to understand how introgressions between ancient species caused diversions in the human genome that allowed the painstaking evolution into the first modern-day Homo sapiens to occur. Artificial intelligence was able to make this discovery because of its ability to identify locations of high divergence in the human genome to indicate locations of potential introgressions between species and further compare the genetic material at these locations, a task that would be almost impossibly painstaking otherwise. This is only the latest in a series of examples demonstrating the usefulness of artificial intelligence in genetic research because of the ability to utilize machine learning to accurately analyze and compare millions upon millions of pieces of ancient DNA with the DNA of modern humans, identifying patterns and connections that otherwise would have gone unnoticed. This has allowed scientists to begin the process of resolving some of the questions that have previously been left unanswered in order to piece together our ancient origins. Elon Musk says scientists only have a 5-10% to chance of being able to make AI safe. Although many people have put a lot of hope in the future of artificial intelligence and in the possibilities that can emerge from a world run with the help of cognizant machines, one tech mogul is not so hopeful. Elon Musk is highly involved in the creation of artificial intelligence as well as research into the development of, of brain-computer interface technology that would allow humans to essentially merge with machines. His company, OpenAI, has even created an artificial intelligence system capable of self-teaching. Yet, despite his heavy involvement in the field, Musk remains apprehensive about a future run by machines and estimates that the ongoing efforts to make artificial intelligence safe for humans only has a 5-10% to chance of success. This dire prediction means that AI will almost certainly pose an immense risk to humankind, and Musk is not the only one to recognize and voice these concerns. Stephen Hawking repeatedly claimed that he was certain that artificial intelligence systems are distinctly dangerous and could potentially replace humans altogether. Yet the realm of artificial intelligence development moves resolutely forward, and with it the capabilities of non-humans. AI systems have been developed that create languages, express curiosity, diagnose illnesses, identify different or unusual behaviors, perform military simulations, and even systems that are capable of creating other AI systems. It would seem that, with only a small amount of further development, the machines would not need us anymore. However, Musk is less concerned with a robot uprising, reminiscent of a scene from a movie, and more concerned with the potential barriers and possibilities that he sees in a future run by artificial intelligence. Firstly, he is wary of the potential for a system to be created that is not only smarter than humans, but also has the capacity for independent learning with no limits. Even though algorithms can be programmed or trained to recognize good and bad actions, they lack the emotional aspect of human feelings. When this unlimited knowledge is combined with the fact that AI machines lack emotions, remorse, or an inherent moral code, the possibilities for what an artificial system is capable of is alarming. Musk is also concerned about the likelihood that this enormous power would be controlled by just a few companies with the funds to develop the technology and there is currently no oversight or regulations that would check the almost limitless power of whoever controlled the realm of artificial intelligence. It remains to be seen whether Musk's predictions will come to fruition, but in the meantime researchers are carefully navigating this never-before-entered realm of non-human intelligence. Lunar Rover Discovers Mysterious Glass Spheres China's U-22 rover has been the force behind several recent discoveries regarding the dark side of the moon and its latest find is especially intriguing. The mission, 
which was the first successful landing on the far side of the moon, has been to uncover hidden secrets kept by the far side of the moon by looking in depth at panoramic images captured by the rover, which was deposited in the moon's massive von Karman crater. One of these images, which proved especially interesting to researchers after they noticed two small intact spheres made of what appeared to be translucent glass. The knowledge that glass spheres were discovered on the moon might alone be surprising information to some. The fact is that glass is not altogether uncommon on the lunar surface. The ingredients needed to create glass are rather simple, just silicate and high temperatures, and the moon has had a large amount of both throughout its lifetime. We know that the moon was the site of extensive volcanism in the past, as well as the location of intense heat generated by meteorites and other foreign bodies. Silicate, which is found all over the lunar surface, was subject to this volcanic activity and high temperatures, resulting in the large amount of glass pieces that can be found across the surface. So, if glass is not rare on the moon, why are these spheres of such interest to the researchers studying U22's images? The answer lies in what the glass can tell us about the history of the moon and the chemical reactions that have occurred. There is a chance that the volcanic activity that led to the other glass remnants also created these spheres. They do appear to be slightly different from other specimens that have been found. Of the previous specimens, any spheres that were discovered were almost microscopic and none measured over a millimeter compared to U22 spheres, which measure between 15 and 25 millimeters in diameter. They also range from transparent to semi-transparent with an interesting vitreous luster. But how did these strange orbs end up on the moon? One theory claims that the spheres are impact spheres, which are created even here on Earth when something hits the surface so forcefully that it generates enough heat to melt the crust. The melted pieces are projected into the air by the impact and cool into tiny glass beads. These beads are usually incredibly small, which likely rules impact out as a direct source of U22's glass spheres. The team studying the images and U22's analysis of their composition believe that they are likely created from a type of volcanic glass called anorthosite, which might have remelted due to the heat of an enormous impact and then cooled into the balls that the rover discovered. The team responsible for the research wrote, as the first discovery of macroscopic and translucent glass globules on the moon, this study predicts that such globules should be abundant across the lunar highland, providing promising sampling targets to reveal the early impact history of the moon. As research continues, hopefully we will begin to be able to peel back the layers of the moon's history and discover more about its formation and life through the millennia. Zach Bagans is a well-known paranormal investigator and the host of the popular television show Ghost Adventures. In 2018, Zach purchased the infamous Devil's Rocking Chair, a haunted artifact that is said to be cursed and responsible for causing harm and even death to those who come into contact with it. The chair originally belonged to the late Ed and Lorraine Warren, famous paranormal investigators and demonologists who investigated some of the most famous hauntings in history. The chair is said to have been used during an exorcism conducted by the Warrens and is believed to be possessed by a powerful demonic entity. After acquiring the chair, Zack placed it on display in his haunted museum in Las Vegas, where it quickly became one of the most popular exhibits. However, in late 2019, Zack announced that he was closing the exhibit and removing the chair from public view. The reason for this decision was reportedly due to the negative effects that the chair was having on visitors and museum staff. People who came into contact with the chair reported feeling nauseous, dizzy, and even physically ill. Some visitors claimed to have had terrifying nightmares after being in the same room as the chair, while others experienced unexplained injuries. In addition, Zack and his team reportedly experienced strange occurrences in the museum, including unexplained power outages and equipment malfunctions, which they believed were directly related to the presence of the Devil's Rocking Chair. As a result, Zack made the decision to close the exhibit and remove the chair from public view, 
stating that he did not want to risk further harm to himself, his team, or museum visitors. The chair remains in Zack's possession, but it is kept in a secure location and is not accessible to the public. The story of the Devil's Rocking Chair and its alleged curse is a fascinating and chilling example of the power that some haunted objects can hold. While skeptics may dismiss the chair's purported effects as mere coincidence or suggestible thinking, the fact remains that numerous people have reported negative experiences after coming into contact with it. As such, the Devil's Rocking Chair remains a cautionary tale for those who seek to delve into the world of the paranormal and supernatural. Zack reported that one of the most haunted places that he investigated was that of the Goatman's Bridge. Goatman's Bridge, also known as Old Alton Bridge, is a historic iron truss bridge located in Denton County, Texas. It was built in 1884 to connect the cities of Denton and Copper Canyon. The bridge has gained notoriety in recent years due to reports of paranormal activity and legends of a mysterious figure known as the Goatman. The legend of Goatman's Bridge dates back to the early 20th century. According to the legend, people have reported strange occurrences around the bridge, including sightings of a shadowy figure with glowing eyes, disembodied voices, and ghostly apparitions. Paranormal shadow people are a phenomenon that has been reported by many people over the years. These beings are described as dark, shadowy figures that seem to move in and out of people's peripheral vision. They are usually seen in places where there is little or no light, and they often have no discernible features or details. While the existence of shadow people is up for debate, many people believe that they are a real phenomenon, with some paranormal researchers believing that shadow people are the result of the human mind trying to make sense of something that is beyond its ability to comprehend. One theory is that shadow people are a type of ghost or spirit that is trapped in our world. They may be the result of someone who has passed away and is unable to move on to the afterlife. Others believe that shadow people are beings from another dimension or universe that are able to cross over into our world. Some people who have encountered shadow people report feeling a sense of dread or fear in their presence. Others report feeling a sense of curiosity or intrigue. There are many theories about the nature of shadow people and what they might represent. Some people believe that they are a sign of impending doom or a harbinger of bad luck, while others believe that they are a manifestation of our subconscious fears and anxieties. Despite the lack of scientific evidence, the phenomenon of shadow people continues to be a popular topic of discussion among paranormal enthusiasts. Many people report seeing these mysterious figures and have shared their stories online and in various paranormal communities. While the existence of shadow people remains a mystery, their popularity in the paranormal world is unlikely to wane anytime soon. Whether they are the result of the human mind trying to make sense of the unexplainable or a real phenomenon that we have yet to fully understand, shadow people continue to capture the imagination of people around the world. Visitors have reported hearing strange noises, feeling an inexplicable sense of dread, and some have even reported being touched by unseen hands. Some have speculated that these occurrences are connected to the tragic history of the bridge. In recent years, the bridge has become a popular destination for paranormal investigators and thrill-seekers. Many people have tried to capture evidence of the paranormal activity, and some have even claimed to have experienced it themselves. Some paranormal investigators have captured electronic voice phenomena recordings, which are believed to be the voices of spirits, as well as photographs and videos of ghostly apparitions. However, the bridge's popularity has also brought unwanted attention. The haunting of Goatman's Bridge has captured the imaginations of many people for over a century. While some dismiss it as a legend or a hoax, others have reported experiencing strange and unexplainable occurrences at the site. Regardless of its authenticity, the legend of Goatman's Bridge has become an important part of the local folklore and a popular destination for those seeking to experience the supernatural. Many paranormal researchers have said that the Goatman's Bridge along with various other sites across the United States, show signs of residual hauntings. Residual haunting is a type of paranormal activity that is said to occur when the energy or emotions of past events are imprinted on a location, creating a recording that can be played back and observed by witnesses. This phenomenon is often associated with traumatic or emotionally charged events. 
Residual hauntings are believed to be different from other types of paranormal activity, such as intelligent hauntings, in that the energy or imprint is not a conscious or intelligent presence. Instead, it is more like a playback of a past event, similar to a tape recording or a movie. There are several theories about how residual hauntings occur. Some suggest that intense emotional energy is released during traumatic events, which can somehow imprint itself on the surrounding environment. Others believe that the energy of a person's thoughts or emotions can imprint itself on the environment, particularly if those thoughts or emotions are intense or repeated over a long period of time. One of the most famous examples of residual haunting is the battlefield ghosts at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Many visitors to the battlefield report seeing ghostly soldiers marching across the field or hearing the sounds of battle echoing through the woods. Other examples of residual hauntings include ghostly apparitions of people going about their daily business in old buildings or the sound of footsteps or other noises that repeat themselves over and over again. One of the most enigmatic figures in history that worked to also be one of the most influential was that of the great Serbian inventor Nikola Tesla. Though Tesla would go on to make headlines across many different news outlets for a number of breakthroughs and inventions, there have been a number of rising rumours and secrets in the modern day, gathered from letters he's written to friends and investors that have led to the realisation of many hidden things about the inventor never known before. An interesting FBI document has been released that details Nikola Tesla did in fact create a death ray. The article reads as follows. References made to the Bureau letter dated January 21, 1943, which bore a caption similar to that mentioned above. The reference letter dealt with the death, on January 7, 1943, of the famous inventor Nikola Tesla, who as well as being the inventor of alternating current, perfected many electrical devices. He is also credited with having developed the death ray, which would safeguard any country from attack by air. On June 9, 1945, a Ralph Bergstresser of New York City furnished information of a non-specific nature indicating that it was his belief that persons sympathetic to Russia were making an effort to secure the effects of Nikola Tesla in order to salvage therefrom any models or designs of possible military value. Mr. Bergstresser claimed that he heard that Abraham Spani, president of the National Latex Corporation of Dover and Delaware, was the motivating influence behind this attempt to obtain Tesla's papers, which are presently held in storage at the Manhattan Storage Warehouse in New York City. Bergstresser promised to return to the New York Field Division shortly after his initial visit and furnish further and more specific information to support his claims. He was not heard from again until September 27, 1945, at which time he furnished the following additional information. He said that a boyhood chum of his from Wichita, Kansas, Blois Fitzgerald, had been Tesla's protégé and one of the inventor's few confidants. According to Bergstresser, Fitzgerald, who is now an army private stationed at Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, is a brilliant 29-year-old scientist who spent endless hours with Tesla prior to the latter's passing, during which time Tesla explained to him secret experiments. Bergstresser stated that Fitzgerald met Tesla in November 1942, but he has been corresponding with the latter since 1935. According to the informant, Fitzgerald had developed some sort of anti-tank gun, the details of which he presented to Tesla, who made certain corrections in design and specifications to further perfect the weapon. Bergstresser related that sometime in December 1942, when Fitzgerald was attending a meeting of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, he made the acquaintance of Abraham Spanel, who became interested in Fitzgerald's gun. Spanel offered financial aid to Fitzgerald, and the two were in the closest contact with each other for a considerable period of time. Bergstresser said that Fitzgerald had lined up a deal for the purchase of the gun, but for some reason, Spinell blocked this deal by reaching top men in the company. Spinell is then reported as having obtained a job for Fitzgerald with the Higgins Shipbuilding Company in New Orleans and negotiated a contract with Fitzgerald for the purchase and manufacture of the gun in a manner which would return a percentage of the profits to Spinell. According to Bergstresser, Fitzgerald is presently working on the perfecting of Tesla's death ray, which, in Fitzgerald's opinion, is the only possible defense against offensive use by another nation of the atomic bomb. In this connection, 
It is noted that the New York Times of September 22, 1940, in an article entitled Science in the News by William Lawrence, science editor, states that Tesla divulged to Lawrence the fact that he had developed a death ray or teleforce, which Tesla claimed would melt airplane motors at a distance of 250 miles, so that an invisible Chinese wall would be built around a country against attack by an enemy air force. This electrical device would operate by the generation of power from a plant, a number of which might be located strategically along our coastlines, and the beam of which would melt any engine within a radius of 250 miles. Bergstresser stated that during Fitzgerald's acquaintance with Spinell, Fitzgerald had told Spinell of his associations with Tesla, and had apparently described to Spanel some of Tesla's most secret work. Bergstresser believes that Spinell, who he claims is definitely pro-Russian in attitude, is now attempting through legal procedure to secure custody of Tesla's effects, which are now held by Tesla's only heirs, one Sava Kosanovich, who is presently in Yugoslavia occupying some governmental post. Nikola Tesla, widely regarded as one of the most brilliant intellects of our time, is now recognized for his groundbreaking contributions. Although his genius was not fully appreciated during his lifetime, the years following his death have brought a newfound respect for his visionary pursuits. Tesla fearlessly delved into the realm of electricity, exploring its potential and pioneering advancements, such as anti-gravity technology and the enigmatic concept of the ether. Similar to many other influential thinkers from the past, Tesla's profound impact on modern-day life often goes unnoticed by contemporary audiences. It is through his extraordinary intellect that the world has witnessed groundbreaking inventions like electricity, radar, microwaves, radio, drones, and countless other remarkable advancements. Undoubtedly, Tesla epitomizes a man whose genius was destined for a different era. Tesla embraced an ancient mystical concept called the ether, which he discussed extensively and believed he could harness its powers to shape a future filled with extraordinary devices, transforming humanity's capabilities. This led to a well-known quote attributed to Nikola Tesla, wherein he envisioned a world where wireless communication would turn the entire Earth into a vast, interconnected network, allowing instantaneous communication and vivid visual and auditory experiences between people no matter the distance. Furthermore, he envisioned handheld devices that could enable these remarkable interactions. The inventor is often associated with a fascinating invention known as his oscillating machine. It has been said that this machine had the capability to create small earthquakes in its surrounding area. Interestingly, it was observed that the machine's power would gradually increase the longer it was left turned on. While some argue that these reports are exaggerated, there is a recorded event from 1912 where a journalist interviewed Tesla and he provided a detailed description of his initial testing of the machine in practical terms. According to the inventor himself, Tesla had brought a small version of his oscillating device, no larger than an alarm clock, and attached the device to the steel framework of a building still undergoing construction. After adjusting the oscillator, the building began to tremble and the structure quickly came down with many believing that an earthquake had just occurred. The police had been called shortly after, as an investigation quickly began, causing Tesla to quickly retrieve his device and leaving shortly after. Although many now believe that the story was made up by Nikola Tesla for nothing more than additional media attention, others disagree given the fact that, theoretically, if an oscillating device could match the resonance frequency of an object, it could begin to cause it to vibrate and tear apart similar to that of a violin shattering a crystal glass. Today, there are no surviving mechanisms of such a device, though researchers are now well aware of a phenomenon known as resonance frequency, in which any element can be broken down when subjected to certain frequencies and vibrations. Anonymous is a loosely associated international network of activists and hackers known for their online operations and digital activism. Since its emergence in the early 2000s, Anonymous has captured the attention of the media and the public, often making headlines with their high-profile cyber attacks and involvement in various social and political causes. Anonymous operates under the philosophy of hacktivism, combining hacking skills with social and political activism. Their actions are often aimed at exposing perceived injustices, promoting freedom of speech, 
and challenging systems of power. One of their most well-known tactics is distributed denial of service attacks, where they overwhelm a target website's servers with traffic, temporarily rendering it inaccessible. While Anonymous is known for their disruptive activities, they also advocate for online privacy and freedom of expression. They have been involved in campaigns against internet censorship, government surveillance, and corporate greed. In the last few days, hacking groups such as Anonymous Sudan have issued a threat to carry out a potentially devastating attack on the European financial system. Their primary target will be the SWIFT International Communication System, and various members have come forward and said that these attacks could have wide-ranging consequences. A video was recently published where the group states that they are retaliating against Europe for its involvement in recent conflicts. According to security experts, although this possibility may seem unlikely, financial institutions should remain vigilant for potential attacks, as some of these groups who are sending these threats have a reputation for launching potent distributed denial of service attacks. Anonymous Sudan, a branch of the larger anonymous hacktivist group, issued a video and multiple messages on Telegram, cautioning about an upcoming destructive attack directed towards the European banking system. The post also suggested the possibility of targeting the US Federal Reserve. The person featured in the video adopts the expected anonymous approach, wearing a Guy Fawkes mask and disguising their voice. They suggest that the banking system holds significant influence. The issue with the group is that not everyone has to agree on the motives, as anyone can join Anonymous, and for this reason in recent years it has become known for engaging in this kind of political manoeuvring, which is consistent with their previous actions of issuing threats to other organizations. The video provides an overview of an upcoming attack, highlighting the knowledge and skills of the group in relation to the European banking system. One of the most notable incidents associated with Anonymous was the Operation Payback campaign in 2010. This campaign targeted organizations that were perceived as threats to internet freedom, such as the Motion Picture Association of America and the Recording Industry Association of America. Through distributed denial-of-service attacks and other methods, Anonymous disrupted the online presence of these organizations as a form of protest against their perceived infringement on digital rights. Another significant event was the 2011 collaboration between Anonymous and WikiLeaks. Anonymous launched Operation Avenge Assange in response to the arrest of Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks. They targeted various websites, including those of payment service providers and government agencies, in retaliation for their actions against Assange. This collaboration highlighted the power of decentralized activism and the ability of Anonymous to mobilize its global network of supporters. However, the decentralized nature of Anonymous also means that anyone can claim affiliation and carry out actions in the name of the collective. This has led to controversy and internal debates within the group regarding the legitimacy of certain operations. Some argue that it dilutes the group's message and allows for malicious actors to exploit the Anonymous brand for personal gain or nefarious purposes. In recent years, Anonymous has continued to make headlines with their involvement in various causes, such as the global protest movements like Occupy Wall Street. They have also targeted extremist groups, exposing their online activities and identities. Through their actions, Anonymous has demonstrated the potential of online collective action in effecting change and holding powerful entities accountable. As of right now, the group has made themselves a prominent and influential collective of activists and hackers who have made a significant impact on the digital landscape. They have challenged authority, exposed corruption, and promoted online freedom of expression. While their actions have sometimes been controversial and their methods debated, there is no denying the role they have played in shaping online activism and bringing attention to social and political issues. Some members of Anonymous have been critical of current events happening in the world right now, leading to certain accounts being banned. The hacking group Anonymous has been a subject of debate and controversy due to their activities and methods. Whether they are perceived as good or bad largely depends on one's perspective and the specific actions being considered. One of the main arguments in favor of Anonymous is their role as digital activists and whistleblowers. They have been involved in exposing corruption, advocating for online privacy and freedom of expression, and challenging oppressive systems. 
Their actions have shed light on issues that may have otherwise remained hidden, sparking important conversations and promoting transparency. Anonymous has played a significant role in amplifying the voices of marginalized communities and shedding light on social and political injustices. Moreover, Anonymous has used its skills to target and disrupt organizations and individuals that are perceived as oppressive or engaged in unethical practices. They have targeted entities such as oppressive governments, hate groups, and corporations involved in shady activities. In some cases, they have successfully disrupted the operations of these organizations, forcing them to reconsider their actions. Supporters argue that such interventions serve as a form of direct action against those who abuse their power and harm others. Additionally, Anonymous has been credited with promoting online activism and the idea that anyone can make a difference. By operating in a decentralized manner, they have empowered individuals to stand up against injustice and express dissent. They have inspired others to take action and have raised awareness about the importance of digital rights and freedoms. In this regard, Anonymous is seen as a catalyst for change, sparking conversations and mobilizing people to take a stand. On the other hand, critics argue that Anonymous's actions often involve illegal activities and violate the principles of law and order. Their use of hacking techniques, such as distributed denial-of-service attacks, can disrupt legitimate services and cause harm to innocent individuals. This raises concerns about the ethics of their methods and the potential collateral damage they may cause. Furthermore, the lack of accountability opens the door for malicious actors to exploit the anonymous brand for personal gain or to pursue their own agendas. Critics argue that this undermines the credibility and legitimacy of the collective, making it difficult to discern between genuine activism and malicious intent. There are also concerns about the potential for indiscriminate targeting and collateral damage. While Anonymous may have noble intentions, their actions can inadvertently harm innocent individuals or organizations that are unrelated to the issues they are addressing. The lack of centralized control and oversight within the group makes it difficult to ensure that their actions are targeted and proportional. As of right now, the assessment of whether Anonymous is good or bad is subjective and depends on one's perspective. Supporters argue that their actions serve as a means to expose corruption, promote transparency, and advocate for online freedom. They view Anonymous as a force for change and as champions of digital activism. Critics, on the other hand, raise concerns about the legality of their actions, potential collateral damage, and the lack of accountability within the group. It is important to critically examine the motivations, methods, and impact of Anonymous to form an informed opinion about their activities, and their role in the digital landscape. Cybersecurity and cybercrime have become significant issues in today's digital age with numerous financial and societal implications. The financial costs associated with cybersecurity measures and the economic impact of cybercrime are substantial. To begin, it is important to understand that the field of cybersecurity encompasses various aspects, including technology, personnel, infrastructure, and policy. Organizations and governments around the world allocate significant resources to protect their digital assets and infrastructure from cyber threats. According to various reports, the global spending on cybersecurity has been steadily increasing in recent years. In 2020, the global expenditure on cybersecurity was estimated to be around $145 billion. This figure includes investments made by both public and private sectors, covering areas such as network security, endpoint protection, data encryption, threat intelligence, and incident response. It is worth noting that this estimate does not capture the full extent of cybersecurity investments, as many organizations also allocate significant internal resources to develop and maintain their cybersecurity capabilities. However, while cybersecurity expenditures are substantial, the costs of cybercrime continue to rise and pose a significant financial burden. Cybercrime involves various illicit activities conducted through digital means, such as hacking, data breaches, identity theft, financial fraud, and ransomware attacks. The financial losses resulting from cybercrime are staggering, impacting both businesses and individuals. Estimating the precise costs of cybercrime is challenging due to underreporting, varying methodologies, and the evolving nature of cyber threats. However, Studies and reports provide valuable insights into the magnitude of the problem. 
According to one estimate, the global cost of cybercrime in 2020 reached $1 trillion. This figure includes direct financial losses, such as stolen funds and monetary damages, as well as indirect costs, such as recovery efforts, reputation damage, and productivity losses. It is important to highlight that the costs associated with cybercrime extend beyond immediate financial losses. Cyber attacks can have long-lasting consequences on businesses and individuals, including legal implications, regulatory penalties, and loss of customer trust. Moreover, cybercrime can disrupt critical infrastructure, impact national security, and undermine economic stability. To counter the growing threat of cybercrime, governments, organizations, and individuals are investing significant resources in cybersecurity measures. The goal is to develop robust defenses, enhance incident response capabilities, and promote cybersecurity awareness and education. Governments around the world are allocating budgets to strengthen their cybersecurity infrastructure and establish frameworks and regulations to combat cyber threats. In addition to government investments, organizations are dedicating substantial resources to safeguard their systems and protect sensitive data. This includes investments in advanced security technologies, employee training programs, security audits, and collaborations with cybersecurity firms. The private sector, including industries such as finance, healthcare, and technology, plays a crucial role in driving cybersecurity innovation and best practices. While the billions of dollars spent on cybersecurity demonstrate the commitment to protect digital assets, it is essential to recognize that cybersecurity is an ongoing battle. Cyber threats continue to evolve and become more sophisticated, necessitating continual investments and advancements in cybersecurity measures. Moreover, the costs of cybercrime are expected to rise as criminals adapt to new technologies and exploit vulnerabilities. Drone finds 1,000-year-old village. We are continuously finding innovative ways to explore new places and terrain. One of the more modern developments in archaeological research is being able to use drones to capture images and share the view of places we have not been able to reach before. Back in 2013, a team of archaeologists managed to use a drone to reveal a village that has been estimated to be about 1,000 years old. The team sent a small drone to Blue Jay, a village that archaeologists first revealed in the 1970s. The village lies 43 miles south from Chaco Canyon in the northwest of New Mexico. This village is home to nearly 60 ancestral Puebloan houses that surround an area that was once a spring. Today, Blue Jay is somewhat in ruins. It is hidden behind various plants and parts are buried in sandstone blown down by cliffs. We have been able to find out a little about the ancient structures of this site through some excavations, though this drone mission revealed an awful lot more. Blue Jay received a visit from a small drone able to capture thermal infrared images. This let the team, quite literally, see what was hiding beneath the surface. The team revealed structures we have never seen before in a Native American settlement. Needless to say, this was a momentous discovery. Jesse Kasana, an archaeologist from the University of Arkansas, said, I was really pleased with the results. He then went on to explain that studies like this can show just how incredible drones or UAVs are in various fields of scientific research. This was not the first investigation of the site, with some excavations having taken place prior. However, the drone images both confirmed the presence of stone compounds we had identified and were already aware of, as well as showing us this new information. Once again, this is great news. The methods we have been using so far are seemingly reliable, and we now have new additional ways to confirm these stone structures without contradicting what we know so far. As with a great number of archaeological discoveries, the thermal images uncovered a lot more than the physical structures. We were also given a window into further cultural understanding. For a while now, Blue Jay has been considered somewhat unusual, a bit of an outlier compared to the surrounding villages. Typically, we expect to see some great houses or kivas, areas of public gatherings or ceremonies, though none of these trademark features of Chaco-era Pueblo sites were seen in Blue Jay. 
The thermal images show a dark circle in the wall of the plaza area. This means we can expect a wetter, colder soil here, which may be filling in spaces where the ceremonies, gatherings and alike events took place. We know there is an underground circular structure of some sort that had been missed when studying before. Not only can these thermal images show us areas of interest, but it also gives us a clear idea of where we can begin looking and prepare and plan a course of digging with direction in mind before any soil has even been taken up. Kasana said, Now that we know what household compounds look like in thermal imaging, we could use it to prospect for structures at other sites. This research method is not limited to this one area. The use of drones, thermal and infrared imaging are all invaluable to so many archaeological sites. The technology works because features like bricks or stone walls keep and release warmth in a different way that the soil that surrounds those features does. This means that even when structures are entirely buried, we can oftentimes view an outline of the structure using heat maps. Of course, the equipment is rather expensive and high-quality imaging devices are key. It's not a new idea to use thermal imaging. It is just simply an expensive and difficult process to initiate. What is even more complex is considering the expenses against the likelihood of crashing the drones. Kasana described it as not a question of if you'll crash it, but of when and how badly. There are issues such as hardware coming loose or software glitching, all of which can cause devastating losses to the equipment. Another hurdle to this research technique is the legality. The Federal Aviation Administration has to implement a series of rules and regulations dictating what is and is not allowed when flying these sorts of drones. There are issues of safety and the law, but hopefully it will be resolved to enough of a compromise that this revolutionary scientific method can still be used and bring all sorts of new discoveries. Earth's crust is dripping like honey into its interior. A mysterious happening is occurring underneath the mountainous range of the Andes. Our Earth's very crust appears to be melting and dripping deeper into the ground. Scientists discovered proof that our planet's crust has been flowing away into the Andes and has been seemingly devoured by the Earth's mantle. In a quest to confirm their data, researchers conducted a sandbox experiment comparing it with the real-life findings. The results confirm that several hundred miles of the Andes have dripped into the mantle. As it turns out, this is not anything new and has occurred worldwide for millennia. Scientists call it lithospheric dripping. The reason it's so profound as a discovery is because we did not know about it before. According to a researcher from the University of Toronto, Julia Anderson, we have confirmed that a deformation on the surface of an area of the Andes Mountains has a large portion of the lithosphere. The Earth's crust and upper mantle below avalanched away. Anderson compared it to dripping like cold syrup or honey deeper into the planetary interior, claiming this is a result of high density. Anderson believes that this lithospheric dripping is responsible for the shifting surface of the Andes. When it comes to geology, there is the upper mantle, the crust, the lithosphere and the lower mantle. The upper mantle is formed of solid rock plates. The lower mantle is where the tectonic plates reside, which are moved by currents of magma. They can create oceans or cause earthquakes. Scientists have been studying the lower mantle and how tectonic plates work for a long time, but are still discovering brand new things in their research. The process of lithospheric dripping goes like this. Two tectonic plates crash together, creating heat. This immense heat and pressure caused them to thicken and drip down deeper into the Earth's mantle, like a sluggish drop of honey oozing from its pot. As this occurs, the weight affects the upper crust and tugs it down, thus forming a temporary basin in the land until the pressure becomes too much and the crust jumps skyward, like a spring, forming mountains. This is how researchers believe the Andes were made. There is evidence in the central Andean plateau to suggest the mountains sprung unexpectedly instead of being formed over time by the process of subduction, another way mountains are formed, which takes far longer over the course of decades, if not centuries. It is thought some of the Andes were formed by a subduction, but fragments of it appear to have only sprung up in our current geological period of the Cenozoic. 
That is to say, they formed within the past 66 million years. Scientists hope to utilize sandbox modeling in the future to test their theories, but are convinced that lithospheric dripping must be a commonplace occurrence for the Andes area. Alongside digital recreations, researchers used a plexiglass tank with the stimulated area of the mantle and crust with the use of silicon polymer to experiment. Anderson recalls, it was like creating and destroying tectonic mountain belts in a sandbox, floating on a simulated pool of magma, all under incredibly precise sub-millimeter measured conditions. Furthermore, Anderson explained, the dripping occurs over hours, so you wouldn't see much happening from one minute to the next, but if you checked every few hours, you would clearly see the change. It just requires patience. Their sandbox experimentation proved that the Andes was created by lithospheric dripping, and that it is perfectly normal to witness it happening now, since the area is susceptible to it. Decoding Whale Language According to an international team of scientists that has started a five-year journey, whales use a pattern of clicking noises referred to as coders to communicate back and forth. Like humans, different tribes have their own special dialects. Scientist Shane Gero is working to understand the whale group in Dominica. Gero studied two whales having an active conversation back in 2008. They used their coda for 40 minutes, communicating and swimming alongside each other. He had followed the specific mammals in the Caribbean for three years. Jero would record their communication, but had not heard a conversation live before. He was entranced. What if scientists had the ability to unlock the meaning of these clicks? They could reveal a shocking understanding of our natural world. For 13 years following, he continued to record more than a thousand audio tracks of coders and clicks. With the tracks, Jero annotated other specific notes, such as which whales clicked at which time, their behavior during, and who or what was in their surroundings. With whales, the big question is whether any of this stuff is even present. Jacob Andreas, a natural language processing expert at MIT and member of Project SETI, tells National Geographic, are there minimal units inside this communication system that behave like language, and are there rules for putting them together? Other scientists say observing their behavior to give the findings context should go along with the millions of coders needed for computers to recognize their speech patterns. For example, hunting or mating clicks may have a specific clicking pattern or tone. It's the cocktail party problem, David Gruber, a professor at the City University of New York, tells National Geographic. Scatter a few microphones around a party and they'll pick up snatches of conversation. But watch people tracking who touches someone's arm, who scans the room for better company, and the whole scene starts to make more sense. To understand the specifics of whale communication, Project SETI will utilize specific audio and video equipment. Some of the tools, including high-resolution hydrophones that record 24-7, reaching thousands of feet under the surface, cameras that scientists will latch to whales using suction cups. These cameras can withstand pressure at extreme depths. Lastly, drones designed to move in water similarly to a fish so they can record without disturbance. Once scientists begin their recordings, they will count on advances in AI to gather and conclude the data identifying key patterns and elements of the whale's language. After these elements are complete, then comes the exciting part, attempting to communicate back with the whales. The posse plans to test its conclusions by broadcasting the vocalizations to the whales and monitoring the results. Their goal is to get the whales to respond back. The question comes up, what are you going to say to them? That kind of misses the point, Jero says. It assumes they have a language to talk about us and boats, or the weather or whatever we might want to ask them about. The primary goal is simply to understand. It's not about us talking to them. This is about listening to the whales in their own setting, on their own terms. It's the idea that we want to know what they're saying, that we care. All three of these mysterious underwater discoveries have one thing in common. Maintaining their habitats is what will keep the research developed with climate change on the rise. Each of these fascinating findings are at risk.
Antarctica, the frozen continent at the southernmost tip of the Earth, has long been shrouded in mystery and fascination. Despite its extreme and inhospitable conditions, it continues to captivate the human imagination. Antarctica remains one of the last unexplored frontiers on our planet. The vast expanse of ice and snow, along with its remote and isolated location, gives rise to a sense of adventure and curiosity. The idea that there could still be uncharted territories and hidden secrets waiting to be discovered fuels our fascination with this remote region. Recently, an individual shared a captivating photograph online, suggesting that it depicts a mysterious structure emerging from the icy surface. The person who made this noteworthy discovery was compelled by the striking dissimilarity of the subject compared to its surroundings, prompting them to zoom in and capture several screenshots. The allure surrounding Antarctica lies in the recurring reports of peculiar findings gradually emerging from the vast ice sheet each year. Notably, some of these objects exhibit distinct sharp corners and edges, fueling speculations that they could be remnants of ancient civilizations. These fascinating occurrences have piqued the curiosity of numerous individuals, sparking further exploration and investigation into the secrets held within Antarctica's frozen landscape. According to one individual, there have been several intriguing findings in Antarctica. Surprisingly, extensive life forms have been discovered beneath the ice sheet, alongside evidence of ancient life. This leads the user to believe that it is only a matter of time before we unearth evidence indicating the presence of ancient humans in Antarctica and their involvement in the construction of large structures. Considering that humans have constructed significant architectural marvels on every other continent, it seems plausible that similar events may have unfolded in Antarctica. This opinion highlights the potential for further exploration and discovery on the icy continent. According to another user, there appears to be a conspicuous presence of a large structure emerging from the ice in Antarctica, and the lines visible do not resemble typical mountain formations present in the vicinity. It is worth noting that, as of now, authorities have asserted that there is no abnormal occurrence happening in Antarctica, and these images merely depict natural phenomena inherent to the region. However, despite these assertions, individuals continue to explore the Antarctic landscape with the hopes of uncovering something extraordinary. The existence of contrasting views and the persistent curiosity of users contribute to an ongoing discussion surrounding the potential discovery of peculiar phenomena in Antarctica. Antarctica holds a profound fascination for individuals due to its status as one of the most uncharted territories on Earth. With only a handful of brave explorers having set foot on this icy continent, it remains shrouded in mystery and invites further exploration. The allure stems from its untrodden paths, untouched landscapes, and mysterious discoveries that are made there each year. According to amateur researchers, there are reports suggesting that certain areas across Antarctica are experiencing ice melting, which is unveiling peculiar formations. This photograph has elicited diverse responses from viewers, with some speculating that the depicted structure resembles a massive fortress or megalith while others propose the notion of it being the remnants of an ancient city. This has led to speculation that it could potentially serve as evidence of early human presence in Antarctica and their involvement in constructing substantial edifices. A perspective shared by one individual regarding these findings is to analyse the images as if they were taken in a different location, disregarding the fact that they were captured in Antarctica. This approach allows for alternate interpretations and perceptions. When you strip away the surrounding circumstances and imagine this scenario as a depiction of an ancient city, it evokes images of a lost civilization unearthed in a desolate desert. The frozen continent of Antarctica has yielded a myriad of intriguing discoveries in recent times, prompting us to contemplate the possibility of sending expeditions there to unravel the mysteries that lie hidden. Antarctica is dotted with various research stations, creating an ideal platform for further investigation. Undoubtedly, many individuals share the curiosity and eagerness to unravel the enigma surrounding these imprints of the past. There have been various perspectives and theories surrounding the intriguing discoveries made in Antarctica. While some suggest that these findings are not unprecedented, 
Others argue that the distinctiveness lies in the level of detail that can be observed. Additionally, an alternative viewpoint proposes that during specific historical periods, certain nations ventured to distant lands to establish strategic structures for military advantage. In this context, some speculate that humans might have been responsible for constructing such edifices during the early stages of their explorations in Antarctica. Through a comprehensive examination, it becomes evident that numerous interpretations exist, underscoring the depth and complexity of the subject matter. According to critics, the occurrence of such discoveries is not uncommon, and the objects that people perceive as mysterious objects buried beneath the snow are simply gaps or depressions in the icy surface. These skeptics argue that when the surrounding ice melts, it can create an optical illusion, making it appear as though something significant lies hidden below. The question of how ancient civilizations could have theoretically reached Antarctica is a topic that combines historical speculation, archaeological inquiry, and the exploration of human capabilities. While it remains a subject of debate and conjecture, examining the potential pathways that might have led ancient societies to this remote continent offers insights into the creative ways human ingenuity and exploration could have transcended geographic barriers. One of the most widely considered scenarios is that ancient civilizations possessed maritime technologies that allowed them to navigate across vast oceans. Seafaring cultures such as the Polynesians, Egyptians, Phoenicians, and even ancient Greeks demonstrated remarkable prowess in navigating open waters. It's possible that ancient mariners could have ventured beyond known coastlines and discovered Antarctica through oceanic exploration. During periods of glaciation, sea levels were significantly lower due to the accumulation of ice on continental land masses. This could have exposed land bridges or shallower waters that allowed for easier passage to Antarctica from other continents. Ancient cultures might have taken advantage of these ice age conditions to journey to the frozen continent. Ancient civilizations developed impressive mapping and navigation techniques that relied on celestial observations, stars, and landmarks. By plotting their courses using these methods, skilled navigators could have embarked on long voyages across open waters, reaching destinations that might have initially seemed out of reach. It's plausible that ancient civilizations possessed knowledge and records that have been lost to time. These might have contained information about navigation routes, geographical details, or accounts of exploratory journeys. The destruction of libraries, the decay of perishable records, or the suppression of knowledge could have erased evidence of ancient encounters with Antarctica. Human migration and cultural exchange have been integral to the development of societies throughout history. The interconnectedness of ancient civilizations through trade routes, diplomatic missions, and shared knowledge could have facilitated the transmission of information about distant lands, including Antarctica. Stories, myths, or legends could have sparked curiosity and exploration. Ancient civilizations displayed remarkable technological innovation in various fields. The construction of impressive structures, advanced metallurgy, and navigation techniques indicate the potential for developing technologies capable of supporting distant explorations. Ingenious solutions to challenges, such as navigation, food preservation, and shelter, could have enabled expeditions to Antarctica. Ancient societies often engaged in exploratory missions driven by religious, cultural, or economic motivations. The search for resources, the quest for new territories, or the pursuit of sacred sites could have compelled explorers to venture into unfamiliar and harsh terrains, including Antarctica. The Earth's climate has undergone significant changes throughout history. Ancient civilizations could have adapted to shifting climates and exploited opportunities presented by altering landscapes. Someone on social media just reported that in a rural village in Ecuador, a peculiar and mystifying event unfolded that would leave residents asking questions. This event, which occurred during the quiet hours of the night, involved an unidentified object plummeting from the sky and striking the ground. The event began early in the morning, when residents of the village were woken up by an earth-shaking tremor accompanied by a resounding thunder-like noise. Startled by the unusual commotion, 
Villagers rushed outside to investigate the source of the disturbance. What they encountered was both perplexing and mesmerizing. Witnesses described seeing strange black materials embedded in the earth, emitting an eerie and ethereal glow. It was roughly the size of a small car and exuded an otherworldly energy. The object was partially buried, and the impact had created a crater in the ground. Its surface appeared to be smooth and metallic, unlike any terrestrial material. Villagers, their eyes wide with disbelief, cautiously approached the strange object. Despite the late hour and the unusual circumstances, there was an overwhelming sense of awe and reverence among those who bore witness to this enigmatic event. News of the strange impact event quickly reached nearby locals, who travelled to the site in order to get a look at the mysterious object. Oddly enough, those who have studied meteor impact said that the object's composition did not match any known terrestrial material or meteorite. Its smooth surface and lack of fragmentation indicated that it had not undergone the usual stresses associated with atmospheric entry. Further analysis revealed that there was no debris nearby and that the impact site showed no skid marks. Many noted that it was as if the object that had struck the ground suddenly vanished. The strange impact event in Ecuador spurred a wide range of theories, with some saying that given the object's unusual appearance and lack of resemblance to known terrestrial materials, it might be of extraterrestrial origin. Another theory proposed that the object could be a piece of space debris, perhaps a defunct satellite or rocket component. However, the absence of identifying markings or typical signs of space debris raised doubts about this hypothesis. A few researchers explored the idea of a natural phenomenon that had yet to be identified, suggesting that the event could be related to uncharted geological or atmospheric processes. As of right now, what caused the impact site and the lack of materials is a mystery. Chuck Schumer is currently being hailed as a hero for pushing a new legislation to declassify government records related to unidentified anomalous phenomena and UFOs. Senator Chuck Schumer, who holds the majority leader position in New York, is advocating for a bill that aims to establish a commission empowered to declassify government records related to unidentified objects. The primary intention behind this effort is to compel the government to disclose its comprehensive knowledge concerning unidentified phenomena. The measure provides an opportunity to counter the spread of theories regarding unidentified objects and address concerns about the government withholding important information from the public. The proposed legislation, which will be presented by Mr. Schumer as an addition to the yearly defense policy bill, has support from both Democrats and Republicans, including Senator Mike Rounds from South Dakota and Senator Marco Rubio from Florida. Senator Rubio has been a strong advocate for legislation that prompted the government to disclose a series of reports on unexplained phenomena. It is also probable that there will be support in the House. As part of the yearly defense bill, the chamber recently added a more limited provision that would compel the Pentagon to disclose information on unidentified objects. Different governmental branches and agencies hold conflicting opinions on the terminology to be used when referring to unexplained sightings. Although the government has decided against using the term UFOs, there is disagreement regarding whether the appropriate terminology should be aerial phenomena or anomalous phenomena. The Senate proposal establishes a timeline of 300 days for government entities to arrange their documentation on unidentified incidents and submit them to the Assessment Committee. President Biden will nominate a review board consisting of nine individuals pending confirmation from the Senate. According to Senate staff members, the objective is to assemble a panel that will advocate for transparency while safeguarding confidential methods of intelligence gathering. The fascination with unidentified objects has long been prevalent, but it has intensified further following the release of a series of videos showcasing unexplained occurrences captured by military sensors. Additionally, naval aviators have recounted perplexing incidents experienced during their training missions contributing to the heightened interest in this subject. Some of the videos released by the Pentagon have been explained as optical illusions or drones, but others remain unexplained and the object of much speculation. Under pressure from Congress, the Pentagon and intelligence agencies have gathered hundreds of reports of unexplained phenomena. Officials have said most of the unexplained incidents are airborne trash 
Chinese spying efforts or weather balloons. American officials have repeatedly said that none of the videos or other material they have collected appears to be evidence of advanced visitation. It is a challenging task to determine the exact number of unreleased documents present in government archives. Government intelligence agencies claim that they have already released all the available material. However, their Freedom of Information departments constantly receive numerous requests for unidentified flying object-related information, only to find out that the archives have already been made public. According to sources close to Mr. Schumer, government agencies, including the Pentagon, have conducted undisclosed work that remains unpublished. This lack of transparency from certain agencies has caused frustration among lawmakers from both political parties. To illustrate, numerous task forces within the Pentagon have extensively examined videos captured by naval aviators and other military personnel which have been kept classified. Certain portions of these videos have been made public, such as during a recent NASA gathering. There are instances where officials suspect that divulging certain information could expose the capabilities of classified optical and sensor technologies. However, for cases where no definitive findings have been reached, officials have been cautious about sharing details regarding their discussions and hypotheses. The hesitancy to disclose all available information pertaining to the unresolved incidents has sparked never-ending conjecture on social media, television programs, and public discussions. Under the proposed legislation by Mr. Schumer, the President would have the authority to postpone the disclosure of specific information selected by the Commission due to national security reasons. However, this bill aims to set a definite timeline for the release of documents and formalize the assumption that such material should be made available to the public. According to Alison Biasotti, a representative for Mr. Schumer, there will now be a procedure in place to declassify this material. Government authorities have consistently stated that they do not possess the wreckage of a crashed, unidentified object or any artificially created substance originating from beyond Earth. The question of why the United States government, along with many other governments worldwide, would withhold information about unidentified objects or unidentified aerial phenomena is an intriguing one. The primary argument for governmental secrecy on unidentified objects revolves around national security. Governments typically classify information that could expose sensitive military technologies or operations. Given that military personnel frequently report sightings during exercises or deployments, governments may worry that disclosing such encounters could inadvertently reveal classified defense capabilities or strategic operations. Moreover, the unknown nature of these aircrafts presents a potential threat that governments may prefer to study quietly, avoiding public panic or exploitation by adversaries. Additionally, Governments might fear that publicizing information could cause public alarm or societal disruption. The idea that unidentified craft are regularly entering our airspace without detection or deterrence might cause distress. Furthermore, the potential advanced origin of these craft, though not confirmed, could challenge many people's fundamental beliefs about humanity's place in the universe, leading to unpredictable societal reactions. Maintaining international relations might be another factor. Publicizing encounters could raise geopolitical tensions, especially if these incidents occur in sensitive regions. Governments might avoid discussing such issues publicly to prevent diplomatic incidents or escalations. On a scientific level, this phenomena often challenge our current understanding of physics and aeronautics. Governments might hesitate to release information that could disrupt scientific paradigms or cause controversy within the academic community. The reputational risk to the scientific establishment might deter open discourse about anomalous aerial phenomena. Lastly, bureaucratic inertia and the potential embarrassment of admitting the lack of knowledge or control over these phenomena might also play a role. For decades, government bodies like the US Air Force have publicly downplayed the phenomena, attributing sightings to prosaic explanations such as misidentified aircraft, weather phenomena, or hoaxes. Reversing this stance could be seen as a loss of face and an admission of a lack of control over national airspace. In recent years, the stance on this topic has shown signs of change. The US government, for example, has become increasingly transparent about its investigations into these aircrafts. The disclosure of credible information regarding the existence of unidentified objects 
or unidentified aerial phenomena would undoubtedly have profound implications for society. From a scientific perspective, confirmed knowledge of these aircrafts would trigger a seismic shift. The existence of technologically advanced, potentially non-human craft would spur an unprecedented need for new research. It would redefine fields such as physics, astrophysics and aeronautics, necessitating the development of new theories and models to explain these phenomena. This disclosure could also inspire a new generation of scientists and innovators driven by the desire to understand and possibly replicate the advanced technology of these unidentified craft. Philosophically, disclosure could challenge our most fundamental beliefs about our place in the universe. If these aircrafts were confirmed to be advanced in origin, the knowledge that we are not alone would resonate on many levels, perhaps even encouraging a sense of planetary unity or a shared human identity. It might prompt us to reconsider long-standing beliefs and worldviews, opening up new horizons in areas like philosophy, religion, and spirituality. Socioculturally, disclosure could lead to significant shifts. The knowledge of other potentially more advanced civilizations might lead us to re-evaluate our societal structures, values, and goals. It could spur a renewed interest in space exploration and stimulate investment in science, technology, and education. However, this revelation could also cause unease or fear, given the uncertainty surrounding these entities' intentions. As a result, governments might face pressure to invest in planetary defense and new forms of diplomacy. Economically, disclosure could have both positive and negative consequences. On one hand, it could stimulate growth in various sectors such as aerospace, technology, and education. On the other hand, the initial uncertainty might negatively impact financial markets or lead to economic instability, at least in the short term. In terms of governance and international relations, disclosure would present new challenges and opportunities. It could foster unprecedented international cooperation as nations collaborate to understand and respond to this shared reality. Alternatively, it could exacerbate geopolitical tensions as nations compete to exploit the new technology for strategic advantage. However, it's important to note that societal reactions would likely depend on the nature of the disclosure. A gradual release of information that confirms unidentified aerial phenomena without confirming an advanced origin might have a subtler impact. In contrast, a sudden dramatic disclosure confirming extraterrestrial life would likely have far-reaching and immediate societal effects. As of right now, the societal implications of disclosure are broad and profound extending to nearly every aspect of life. This potential future reminds us of the importance of continuing to investigate these phenomena, not just to satisfy our curiosity, but also to prepare ourselves for the significant changes that such a disclosure might entail. As the discourse on mysterious aircrafts continues to evolve, it will be crucial to consider these possible implications and foster a societal dialogue on this fascinating subject. So, what do you make of these recent announcements? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.